Catholic something University is, because something the corporate is wrong. identity is that it's Freie Universität in any language. Ah, okay. So they have oh, all right. <laughs> Ready? Okay. Good afternoon and welcome to a slightly modified afternoon session. Um, so before we start, just just to make sure that we are all conferencing amongst consenting adults and that nobody is coerced to be part of this conference, I have to read a disclaimer. So bear with me. All statements expressed by the Foundation Jotilio Vargas employees and guests in our online events and broadcasts exclusively represent their opinions and not necessarily FGV's institutional position. We also reiterate that everyone present here has agreed to participate in this event of their own free will and that they consented to be recorded in this broadcast, which will be posted let, uh, later on FGV's official channels. Uh, to continue with this transmission, we ask that you express your agreement by verbalizing or signaling your agreement by remaining in your seats. Thank you. So, wow. <laughs> so we, <laughs> we now have consent. <laughs> So uh, thank you very much, and uh, we will start uh, this afternoon's presentation with Joanna Schnabel, who's going to talk about managing interdependencies in a federal system. Joanna, over to you. Okay. Well, I'm going to stand if that's okay, because otherwise I might risk uh, falling asleep uh, now after <laughs> innovation. 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 Yeah. innovation. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm waiting for the slides to come up. Okay, I can see them, but no one else can. Uh, <laughs> I know. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay yeah. now you can. Okay. Perfect. So this afternoon, I'm going to talk about managing interdependencies in, in federal systems, building on what uh, has been said yesterday, what Yvonne said in her, uh, in her presentation earlier, and very briefly to give, a, give you an idea of, uh, okay, this does not work, so I would like to see the next slide. That's, that's changing. This is yeah, this is changing. This is not changing. Uh, not that it means that everybody else has to come here. And <laughs> oh, okay. Now it seems to work. Okay, excellent. Perfect. So very briefly to give you an idea of what I'm going to talk about. Um, I first want to, and, and you all know that, briefly mention why um, interdependencies exist in, in federal systems or what interdependencies exist. I'll talk then about intergovernmental relations as the main mechanisms through which these interdependencies are managed. I'll discuss the purpose of intergovernmental relations and then I, I'll focus on discussing a few issues regarding the way intergovernmental relations work. So I'll more present questions than answers <laughs> actually in this talk. And then uh, in, at the end of my presentation, I will present the German system. I'll tell you this is how ev it should work everywhere because it's the best system. Um, obviously, I'm not going to do that. I want to talk about a few conditions that I think we should consider when thinking about designing and making intergovernmental relations work. So I d explicitly don't want to present one model and say this is how, how things should, should work. Interdependencies in federal systems. Um, as Alan presented yesterday, as had be, has been said a few times in, in the presentations here, federalism is a system that relies on the idea of autonomous governments, of government aut autonomy. Nevertheless, what we have in, in reality in, in all federal systems is that the two orders, two or three orders of government are interdependent in, in many regards. This can be formally built into the institutional setup of, of the system namely when powers are concurrent or shared, or if we have a system of administrative federalism, which I'm not going to explain now because that, that has been explained, but that obviously makes the federal government and the constituent units interdependent when it comes to, to public policy making. But apart from these interdependencies built in uh, the institutional system, we also have many situations where governments are interdependent de facto because policy problems cut, cut across different jurisdictions assigned to different orders of government. Policy making can create certain externalities, 
that um, reinforces interdependencies and then um, governments can also be interdependent because their fiscal dependencies, constituent units are often fiscally dependent on the federal government, which reinforces this, this mutual dependence within the federal system. And what emerged in response to these interdependencies is what we call intergovernmental relations, which I find is a term that's a bit misleading because it actually says everything and nothing, um, but it's the best term we have so far, and there's a general agreement that intergovernmental relations is about the structures and mechanisms that exist through which governments of a federation manage, um, sorry, interact to coordinate policy making usually. Intergovernmental relations are seen as being ubiquitous ubiquitous, uh, a term I don't quite know how to pronounce, uh, if sometimes underappreciated, a, a ubiquitous, if sometimes underappreciated dimension of federal systems. Okay, or is that better? Yeah. Okay, sorry. <laughs> um, s which has been highlighted by Prahi and Saunders in a book they edited on, on IGR. David Cameron said that IGR are the workhorse of any federal system, and I think it's quite generally understood that IGR are very, very important for the operation of federalism. But the question is, what does that actually actually mean? Um, and that's that's what I'm going to, to talk about. But I want to do some expectation management. I want to highlight that although IGR exists in all federations, they are not what makes a country federal. Federalism is about autonomy, and IGR exists because they are autonomous governments that have to manage these, these interdependencies that exist. Federations are not formed to have IGR. And, and this is very important, IGR can foster federal success, and I put this in, in quotation mark because what federal success actually means is, <laughs> is uh, open to debate, depends on the specific context and so on, but there's a reason why a country is federal, there is something that federalism is expected to deliver, IGR can help a country, can help a federation do that, but there are no guarantee, and I think Jenna Bettner's book for all its flaws and uh, and uh, abstractions highlights very nicely how the different parts of a federal system play together to make federalism work, and that applies to IGR as well, which is something she, by the way, does not mention in, in her book. And I think that's another very important point when it comes to IGR. They are shaped by political will. They're very much dependent on and very often on the political will of the, the prime minister or president to make IGR work, but also obviously on the leaders of the constituent units. They are shaped by partisan dynamics, that was mentioned earlier, um, and by the general political institutions within which they, uh, they operate. Now, what are IGR? IGR are um, two types of, of mechanisms. On the one hand, legislative mechanism. On the other hand, executive mechanisms that include yeah, the, the executive branch of government. I'll not go too much into detail about legislative mechanisms because that's what Antonio Suarez is going to talk about later. But just to give you an idea, legislative mechanisms include second chambers, or upper houses, interparliamentary cooperation, which can take various forms, um, can also include legislative instruments such as model laws, which is something that's used in the US, or framework laws, which is something that's used in Brazil, Spain, and Germany. Now, executive mechani mechanisms can be intergovernmental agreements, or some kind of treaty signed between, um, between governments. Governments can also establish joint bodies. In, in Australia, for instance, there's a, and I always forget what it stands for, ACARA, I think, the Australian Curriculum Ed and Education Something Authority that is set up by the states and the Commonwealth to develop a national uh, curriculum. There can be consultation requirements, which is something Switzerland has, where the constitution requires the federal government to consult the cantons before passing uh, legislation that, that affects them. And finally, and that's what I'm going to focus on, um, uh, executive mechanisms include intergovernmental councils, so the council of the federation, federation council is going to be established here, is one, one of these councils, and they are the most formal, most visible mechanism of intergovernmental relations. Ivan explained for, uh, earlier that IGR and intergovernmental councils can include the federal government, in which case we call them vertical uh, councils, or um, are just bodies of the constituent units, so can be horizontal. And what uh, happens in many countries as well is that to manage IGR, um, governments set up so-called IGR departments or departments within departments to manage intergovernmental relations. Don't have to, but that often exists. So this is just an example, uh, a picture I quite like, 
of uh, the first minister's meeting in, in Canada in 2016, where the prime minister um, presents the, the, the outcome of the, of the discussions. So this is a typical intergovernmental council. Um, we don't necessarily have these, these press conferences, but they give some visibility to, to this council. Yvonne very briefly mentioned that earlier, to get an idea of what, how IGR do, what their purpose is, especially what the purpose is of, of intergovernmental councils as the, their main formal mechanism. Natalie Bink and Sean Muller have, uh, have presented four categories of, uh, to describe the purpose of, of intergovernmental councils. Those are influence, the governments might try to influence each other by, um, at, yeah, at council meetings. Councils can be used to, uh, for autonomy protection. This is something that happens in several instances if the, the constituent units work together within a council and by working together, by harmonizing policy, for instance, they can signal to the federal government that federal intervention is not, not needed. IGR and intergovernmental councils are often used for cooperation, coordination, cooperation, um, and finally to exchange information. And the reason I, I'll not go too much into detail of what, what yeah, each of those mean, but what I want to highlight here is that not in all countries do IGR fulfill all those purposes, and not every uh, council fulfills all those purposes. So we can, depending on the specific council, and for reasons actually don't <laughs> fully understand yet, certain councils fulfill some of those purposes, others do not. In certain countries, some of the purposes prevail, and others, uh, other purposes prevail. Now, the most important, or one of the important questions is, how do IGR, do IGR actually contribute to the success of a, of a federation? And I think there are two sides to consider here. On the one hand, coordination in general, and then obviously the mechanism that foster uh, coordination can lead to better outcomes. They can lead to more, ef more efficient policy making, more effectiveness, they can promote equity. For instance, if governments meet to set national standards, harmonize policy making. And they can foster cohesion and integration, which Popoli has highlighted is very important to make federalism work. She herself coming from, from Belgium, so having a country in mind that is disintegrating rather than integrating, so that needs cohesion to, to continue to, to um, persist. And um, in her book, she writes that there's a search for a pe perpetually contested optimal balance between autonomy and cohesion. I think that describes federalism quite nice. We have autonomy, but we also need to have some mechanism to, um, to s for, for the country to stay together because autonomy is not uh, all, all there is. And such cohesion can be um, established through federal governments. So centralization can promote cohesion, but um, but cohesion can also be promoted by through cooperation, through intergovernmental relations. And if this is the case, then intergovernmental relations can actually be an, an alternative to, to, to centralization. On the other hand, IGR tend to be very complex. They tend to slow down decision-making, policy-making. They usually operate behind closed doors, so there's a lack of transparency <laughs> and parliamentary scrutiny. And I think that's an important point. They can lead to frustration uh, on the side of public officials who have to go through all these meetings, prepare those meetings, but also on the side of the public who has to wait for governments to finally reach, the, reach uh, agreement before an, something happens. And um, related to that, IGR can increase the workload of public officials. I was at a meeting in, in Switzerland a little while ago where someone asked whether there should be a new crisis coordination committee, and one of the... <laughs> The public uh, officials uh, sitting there said, please don't establish yet another body. We are busy enough with the ones we, we have. And um, what I noticed when, yeah, when, when hearing statements like this is that what's important to keep in mind is that cooperation should also not be an end in, in itself. Cooperation, coordination should occur because there is something to coordinate and cooperate. To, yeah, there's a, cooperation is, is needed. But uh, IGR should not be something that is used because it's there and because that's always how things were, were done. I think that's important because if this is the case, then IGR become a threat of, of autonomy to, to autonomy, um, and um, yeah, and actually undermine self governments and the whole idea of of uh, federalism. Now, having highlighted all this, I want to go through a range of issues that I think are important to consider when thinking about how to design. Uh, intergovernmental councils, how to make IGR work. As I said, those are more questions than answers. 
the, the first question is, what degree of formalization, how formalized or how institutionalized should intergovernmental councils be? And um, I have to apologize to John Fillimore, whose um, name I misspelled, there should be a second L. Nevertheless, it should not distract from, from this, this quote I quite like, the written by John Fillimore and Alan Fenner, who say that COEX, or the uh, predecessor to National Cabinet in Australia, is in the main simply the occasional summit meetings of first ministers from across Australia rather than an institution in any meaningful sense. Uh, now, apart from this being a source of disagreement between <laughs> Alan and myself, because um, I think it's also an important statement, an important thing to consider about how do we actually see IGR, what is RGR, what is RGR, what are intergovernmental councils. And I think um, John and, and Alan are wrong in uh, pretending that COAG is actually something that, and he likes to say that, uh, doesn't exist, merely occurs. But I think it, the fact that it occurs actually says something about it, its existence, because if the, the Prime Minister in Australia says COAG is going to meet next month, or a National Cabinet is going to meet next month, the states are going to show up. Right? So it's not just something that's, that's out there. There is a certain expectation that they will come. They might not, might not be the premiers of the states themselves, but they will send someone to, uh, to attend those meetings. So in some way, it seems to exist in, in one way or another. Whether we call it an institution or not, I think is not that important in this regard. And the whole question about formalization, institutionalization, and the question of yeah, whether something exists or not is, um, is important because formalization, institutionalization are associated with more reliability and continuity. So if a council has a regular meeting schedule, has a secretariat that, uh, that runs affairs in between meetings, there is an expectation that, yeah, members will, will show up, that uh, coordination is ongoing and, um, and iterative uh, in the end. Um, formalization, institutionalization reduce dependence on, on political will. If meetings are scheduled well in, in advance, a change of government will not change and meetings will still occur. Um, and yeah, in formalization, institutionalization promote a partnership between orders of government and can also help uh, to protect their, their autonomy. At the same time, Simmons finds in a study admittedly on Canada and two specific policy sectors that there is no effect of a higher level of institutionalization, compromising and consensus building. Um, and another downside of a higher level of formalization, institutionalization can be that it increases workload, as I said, if there are too many committees uh, that might, yeah, is, might, might, might be overwhelming and might actually lead to more complexity or rigidity and might not uh, provide the flexibility might be needed to, to deal with current uh, challenges. And so that is one of the questions I would like to raise. Is maybe informality in the end better? Um, this is just a <laughs> very brief uh, overview. I'm definitely not going to into de detail about the Australian system, so the, the new Australian, Australian system that suggests a very high degree of formality. And I mean, they seem to have thought through this, uh, this chart, but this does not represent how things work uh, in, in practice. And this is, might actually be something that might might offer too much complexity and slow down the whole process. Um, second important, potentially the most important issue is what is the role for the federal government. There is evidence that what Sharp, Sharp calls hierarchical coordination, so top-down coordination, leads to more efficiency and, and effectiveness and faster response, faster decision making. At the same time, hierarchical coordination is often ignorant of local conditions, so things that are decided in Brasilia might not take into consideration what Sao Paulo needs, and, but will nevertheless apply to the whole, to the whole country. Um, and might also disregard the capacity of, of the constituent unit to actually implement those, those decisions. And I think it's important here to remember that federalism is based on shared sovereignty or divided sovereignty, whatever you want to call it. It's not a principal agent model. The constituent units are not agents and should not be agents of, of the federal government. And so having a dominating role of the federal government is actually a, a problem. And I'm saying this mainly addressed at the federal representatives here who should take this into, into consideration. And um, five minutes, okay. And I'm saying this because if we look at the empirics, we see that in most cases in which there are vertical institutions, so 
uh, councils that involve the federal government, these are dominated by the federal government. The federal government usually chairs those meetings, provides a secretariat, and then actually dominates um, intergovernmental relations and yeah, coordination among orders of government. Then we don't have the partnership on which federalism should be built. Uh, next question is what role for the P Council? And Yvonne talked about this earlier. Um, we have in most federations some kind of P Council, generalist council that involves either the heads of government, uh, sorry, ha involves either prime ministers, presidents, or governors, or uh, entire governments. And that usually focuses on more cross sectoral issues, highly political issues. And the question is, to what extent should this P Council be like an, an apex, I think Rupak said, intergovernmental body that manages the whole system or should be independent? Um, and based on the research Yvonne and I did, we found that this is not the case in Germany. The, the P Council there is actually not a, uh, does not play a reading law role. But while we can see this to some extent in Germany, especially during COVID-19, but so this is still a bit of an, of an open question. Now, having said all this, uh, why does it actually really matter? And um, that's what I told you in the beginning. At the beginning, I don't want to present a model to be applied uh, everywhere, and that makes uh, yeah describes the conditions for, for success. But I want to highlight three models that I could see that can be applied to organize intergovernmental relations. And I think which model will work depends, of course, on, on politics, because things always depend on politics. But I think should also take into consideration the specific needs, preferences, and context of, of a federation. The first model that I identified is the one that's built on, on partnership. And that's the model where we have intergovernmental councils that have a rotating chair independent secretariat, several committees that feed into, into the process. We have frequent and regular meetings, different types of councils or councils in which the federal government participates, councils in which it does not participate, and that at the same time provide scope for flexibility. So for instance, if there is a crisis, councils can react quickly to organize, to organize meetings. And I guess this is the model we find in most of, let's call them Western federations. Um, though to different extents, and I would say governments are more partners in Germany and Switzerland than they are in Australia and Canada, where we often have this top-down process in intergovernmental relations. Another model I wanted to, uh, to present is what I called hierarchical coordination, again, for lack of a better, better word. And this is a model where we have a strong federal, federal government, so where the answer to my question about the role of the federal government would, have, would be leading role federal government would chair meetings, would organize secretary, would be in charge of, uh, of the council, could use intergovernmental relations to offer financial incentives or to coerce the constituent units into promoting its national, national agenda and would use intergovernmental councils to monitor whether constituent units actually do what, what it asks them, them to do. Of course, this is, as I said earlier, a model that does not fall, do full justice to, to the idea of federalism. It should not be a principal agent um, arrangement, but at the same time might respond to certain needs of a potentially post-conflict society, de developmental state, um, and so on. So I just want to put this out there. And then finally, another model would be one that relies more on bottom-up influence, so where the constituent units take the initiative, shape policy making in, in the federation, where we would have very strong horizontal councils, which a federal government does not participate, the federal government cannot dominate, um, that they use for joint position taking to gain leverage vis-a-vis -vis the federal government, in which IGR departments are very strong and, and, and shape this process, and in which informal contacts are also very strong, so th that we have this ongoing coordination among the constituent units with a weaker role of the federal government. As I said, I just want to put these out for, for discussion, and I will finish on this and look forward to any comments and questions. Thank you, Joanna, for sticking to time in a very riveting discussion. I didn't see any yawns around the room, so clearly this, was very, this went over very, very well. Uh, now, Eduardo Green is going to provide the Brazilian perspective on interdependency.
Good afternoon, everyone. So maybe considering the criticism presented by Johanna, oh, sorry, Alan, Alan is, is going on. Because I, I was thinking about that. Alan, please, just a moment, because I have a question for you. <laughs> Consi <laughs> considering the criticism presented by Johanna to you, maybe I, I would have a first question. Is Australia a federation? <laughs> 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 no, I'm, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> okay. I'm quite offended by Johanna taking the opportunity to criticize my Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Thank you so much. So, well, uh, thank you, everyone. I will try to, to present some perspective considering our experience in Brazil, uh, at least taking into account these uh, issues involving intergovernmental relations and decentralizations. And also, I, I would say that perhaps we repeat some concepts presented by my Brazilian colleagues, including because I think it's very difficult to... Uh, oh, here is the presentation text. So I think it's very difficult to talk about managing in the interdependence in Brazil without considering some general characteristics how our federation, in fact, is organized. So basically, the idea is to start introducing some very general uh, characteristics of Brazilian Federation. So again, firstly, uh, Brazil is uh, in fact, or uh, de jure, a uh, very symmetric federation. Uh, you remember that um, yesterday, Marta Hetti told us that in fact, the federal level has a lot of power in order to set or to uh, establish standard rules. Oh, we are used to use the hands and not the microphone when you are talking, so. <laughs> Thank you, Catarina. So, uh, in fact, Brazil is a very symmetric federation considering the constitution. Uh, the rules are uh, applied to the whole levels of government in the same way, but in fact, Brazil is a very unequal and asymmetric federation de facto. So this caused many problems in intergovernmental relations because you have a lot of different state capacities, you have a lot of different um, quality in our bureaucracy at the subnational level. So this is the first issue I think is very relevant to uh, put in focus. And the second uh, issue is uh, Brazilian Federation is, I would say it's a very particular in comparative perspective because you have three levels of constituent units as many of the Brazilian colleagues mentioned yesterday and today. And the third issue, if you remember, yesterday Marta told us that federal government in Brazil has a lot of uh, so-called exclusive competence. We are talking about 30 exclusive competences. That's to say that only federal government can establish rules in different public policies. So the point is, um, is there any area in which the federal government is uh, forbidden to intervene? Virtually no. The federal government can define laws, can define rules, and can intervene in almost in every sector, uh, whatever it wants. The fourth, the fourth issue is the federal government, uh, exactly because of that, uh, has a significant power in order to establish rules, norms, and more than that, to use the power of the poor to induce the subnational governments to adhere to their policies, for example, in the case of health, social assistance, education, uh, to mention maybe the three most welfare policies. Uh, anyway, Brazilian Federation mix um, some levels of autonomy. And why? Because our decentralization model enforces municipalities principally to implement public policies. But on the other hand, our constitution also uh, has many articles uh, incentivizing the cooperation. So it's not possible to classify Brazil as a dual or integrate or a, or a cooperative or just administrative federation. A Brazilian federation would say it's a mix, these two kinds of characters. So uh, sometimes we have a more dualistic characteristic. For example, when municipalities are competing each other, in the so-called fiscal war in order to attract investments. So in this case, they are using their dualistic power or their autonomy. But on the other hand, 
one municipalities can cooperate with each other based on intermunicipal consortia, they are using the, the, the possibility to cooperate with each other. Okay. Oh, okay. So uh, maybe the first question is referred to the, the talk we have uh, today morning, is the recentralization process uh, that is started in Brazil, I would say, uh, since the means of the 90s, especially in two dimensions. Or so basically in one of the first dimension was the fiscal one, and the federal government uh, regained much more power in order to reduce the autonomy of the national governments. The second dimension is administrative. Uh, the federal government uh, started to implement different programs uh, enforcing the subnational governments to obey these rules. And even the political dimension also, we have some uh, retrenchments of this character. Is, for example, uh, the federal government, uh, through one constitutional amendment, defined that whole municipalities, uh, considering the size, population size, uh, must have the limited figures of councillors. So in this case, uh, re uh, 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 reducing the political autonomy of the municipalities to decide how many councillors the city, in fact, uh, should have. So, uh, so in this case, this is a whole picture in order to, to present how our intergovernmental relations, in fact, uh, can be established. And interdependence in Brazilian Oh, oh, yeah, yes. Yeah. Always is the same mistake. Yes. <laughs> or should I have slides? <laughs> it's much more easy to see my computer than the, the screen. <laughs> <laughs> so, thank you, thank you. And uh, so, interdependence in Brazilian Federation. Uh, in fact, uh, I would say that uh, the literature always uh, say to us uh, there are, this is uh, exclusive competences or concurrent competences, but in Brazil we have also the common competences. What are common, uh, what are common competences in the Brazilian case? Administrative competences. For example, health policy is responsibility of federal, state, and municipal level. At the same time, it's possible that we can find some overlapping, but at the same time, you can find some hollows because maybe any level of government can intervene in this policy. So this is administrative competence. It's different from legislative powers. So the jury, we have common administrative competences and concurrent legislative powers, but de facto, we have a, a small a set of uh, residual or ex exclusive powers of constituent units. For example, uh, if you remember, Marta mentioned Yesterday, that the states, for example, have one small residual power in order to establish the so-called metropolitan regions. Except this residual power is very difficult to, 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 to say to that, yes, the states have residual powers. Or municipalities in general have uh, the possibility to implement policies according to the so-called, between commas, local interest. But what is the local interest when the federal government has third exclusive competences and can intervene in different public policies? So, in fact, our federation is not only centralized, but also the residual powers uh, available to subnational uh, level is quite is small. And we should consider also that Brazil, historically speaking, is uh, classified as a holding together federation. And there is a high discretion and there's a quite high jurisdictional authority uh, from federal government in every, I would say, uh, almost the international intergovernmental arenas. Uh, this federal framework legislation delimits the authority of constituent unities or regulating the way how states and municipalities can behave according to different rules. And, but also, our federation is based on the principles of local interest and subsidiarity. That's to say, uh, uh, at one point, municipalities and states can implement public policy. But if the, there is one federal law, this federal law is, has uh, a supersede or, or, or intervene in order to define one general rule. How the federal government, in general, behaves establish general rules, 
the conclusion is the residual powers are quite small in this case. And finally, uh, we should also uh, keep in mind that our Supreme Court is, is a very powerful actor uh, and in general uh, confuse federal uh, right with the, 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 the rights defending federal level. So in general, the Supreme Court decides in favor of the federal government. Uh, the only exception, or not, not the only exception, but the one relevant exception occurs exactly uh, during the pandemic period when considering this according to the, the classification presented by Marta Hetje, the scientific party won the wars against the negation, negationist party. So in this case, the Supreme Court decided in favor of the municipalities and states. So I would say that we can classify our intergovernmental relations so, uh, considering at least three, thank you for back, uh, three dimensions or two issues, uh, political issues. It's possible that uh, constituent units can participate in the, in the, in the, in the power uh, at the central level uh, based on the presidential coalition because our so-called uh, coalition uh, presidentialism compose uh, the majority in the, in the, in, at the center of the power uh, calling representatives from states or calling representatives from different political parties to compose uh, the presidential coalition. Uh, based on inter intergovernmental lobby, because we have in Brazil, it's, I would say, very powerful actors representing municipalities, especially municipalities, but also the states, and or uh, based on vertical or horizontal formal or interformal networks. The second relevant dimension is uh, through public policies, and so in this case, depend it depends on each sector. I will uh, present in more, much more details. Um, 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 in some minutes ahead, but in general, federal government has uh, 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 in different policies exactly because uh, it has uh, 30 exclusive competences, a lot, of, a lot of power in order to establish uh, regulatory uh, setting. And uh, our federation may be different from other cases; is more organized based on the so-called picket fence model. We have uh, a stronger channels to establish uh, intergovernmental relations considering different sectors than jurisdictional basis. Um, I, I will talk for some minutes ahead, maybe explaining more these, these characteristics. And the third, the, the third one is the fiscal dimension. We have conditional and unconditional uh, transfers. And we have, uh, I would say, the significant vertical fiscal balancing considering uh, the way how the, our fiscal model is, is organized. So, uh, taking into account the model presented by Johanna, um, legislative and administrative mechanism, there is an interrogation considering the case. Oh, again, oh my God, what's going on? Yes, thank you. Yeah, 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 sure, sure. For me, it's absolutely clear, my slides. And uh, the, the, federal, uh, the federal Senate, there is an interrogation, and why? Because uh, considering Many empirical studies, including one very compelling article produced by Marta Hetchy, and including considering some studies by my colleague Claudio Couto that will share the session next session with Antonius. Uh, in Brazil, in many cases, the federal Senate is more a political party house, center house, defend the state interest. So there is an interrogation. We have a, a, a huge symmetry, symmetry of legal rules. We have different national uh, systems of public policies, and considering administrative, administrative mechanism, we had uh, uh, 20 years ago uh, the first experience uh, trying to implement one so-called Council of Federation, firstly called uh, Federative Articulation Committee, and currently uh, the, the, the federal government is trying to implement the so-called Council of Federation that you have opportunity to, to learn more from this experience maybe uh, ahead. And also we have formal policy vertical committees in health, social assistance, and finance. This is the two formal uh, sectoral uh, uh, committees. Also, we have informal policies, uh, vertical IGR uh, organizations, especially in education, and one generalist forum uh, created in 2017, so-called Forum of States Governance. 
And also you have so different multi-level agreements, uh, such as basic community, basic, basic committees, and also national councils, for example, in health and social assistance. And, and now uh, uh, advancing the comment. In the same sector, we have administrative committees, for example, in health and, and, and social assistance, but also we have multi-level agreements. I will explain, to you. maybe it could be a little bit complicated, but, but I promise I will do my best in order to explain how in the same sector we can have two, two kinds of committees working at the same time. So, and also horizontal uh, intergovernment agreements, especially in Brazil, we have a, a strong experience in considering uh, consortia involving especially municipalities, but also recently uh, states. And finally, we have, uh, I would say, virtually uh, each state or, or big cities also 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 uh, have IGR departments or even state offices in Brazil. So, uh, two examples of formal sectoral and vertical networks: health and health and public policies. Uh, in this case, federal government has a normative power over rules and funding. In this case, the power of the poor is, is quite high. However, uh, the federal government needs to pact with the subnational governments how to implement public policy at, at the subnational level. Uh, constitu constituent units protect their autonomy against unilateral decision from federal governments is quite relevant. Even if Brazil is a, is a, is a uh, highly centralized federation, this kind of forest can protect at least, at minimal way, this kind of, I would say, encroaching from the federal government over the constituent units. Uh, there are frequent and regular meetings, including with it's a, it's a, a lot of transparency it's possible to consult uh, the, the, these meetings on the internet. And there are two so-called uh, uh, Intermanagerial tripartite committee formed by the two levels of government and intermanagerial inter, inter bipartite committees formed by state and, and, and municipal representatives in health and education and social assistance. Constituent, constituent, constituent units have their own cooperative awareness. Uh, for example, councils of secretariats. We have this is, uh, one national council formed by municipal secretaries. We have a state. Uh, council formed by state secretaries and so on. And these photos represent constituent units at the federal and state level. And there is a significant technical exchange uh, in these photos. But considering the, the international uh, uh, experience, unfortunately, we are not talking about IGR councils because these are administrative committees only responsible for pacting uh, issues involving funding, rules, technical exchange, and so on. They are managerial committees subordinated to the respective national councils. So this is the point. National councils is formed by uh, service providers, government representatives, workers of each sector, and also uh, users. So this is a multi-level uh, multi council this multi-level government council is, has the, the, the last word considering the definitions and health and social assistance policies. Five minutes, okay. And so in this case, these committees are subordinated to these national uh, councils, and these national councils are multi-level agreements um, in, in this way. So in, in some lessons of Brazilian case, sexual and vertical cooperation model, national policy system model is an important contribution to, to Brazilian uh, federalism. Other areas has followed this path, although without same, the same success, for example, uh, public safety, environment, sports, traffic, social interest, housing, culture, housing, drug policy, and the promotion of racial inequality. There are a lot of different reasons explaining why uh, these other uh, 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 sectors were not successful in implementing uh, this model, but I do not have uh, time. I, we can talk later on if you want. And the point is we, we have only in health sector, in social assistance, this is former arenas organized. Uh, however, uh, in the case of uh, uh, finance or fiscal policies, uh, our uh, federalism is less virtuous uh, because the trajectory is more marked by competition than uh, cooperation involving especially states, but also municipalities. 
And this, this federative arena dedicated to establish these agreements uh, uh, have been failed in order to establish cooperation in our fiscal uh, federalism. And so changing now to another model, generalist and vertical cooperation model, the first experience was the so-called Federative Articulation Committee uh, established uh, by uh, Lula's government uh, 20 years ago. I would say uh, very briefly this, uh, this, this experience uh, uh, was not successful and why? Uh, maybe so it's two uh, very brief reasons. Uh, first of all, because the federal government tried to skip uh, over the states, establishing direct connection uh, with the municipalities. So it's very difficult to, to coordinate uh, the, the decentralization process in Brazil without having the support from the states. And, and the second problem was uh, this CAF, the so-called CAF, it, uh, it was a weak arena, uh, uh, not having intragovernmental intra power in order to establish intergovernmental agreements without having power to establish coordination within the government, it's not possible to have power to establish intergovernmental agreements. So basically this, the reason behind of, uh, this is not what's successful. So some lessons from, of Brazilian case. Um, federal uh, Forum of, uh, I promise that I will learn by the end of my presentation. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so some lessons of Brazilian case, uh, the forum of governments and consortia and generalist and horizontal cooperation model. By expanding the horizontal cooperation between the states, the Brazilian federalism is closer to the other uh, uh, countries, for example, considering the case of uh, Germany, uh, when it's possible to, 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 to find some regional forums from a bilateral function. Canada, uh, the, the, where is, uh, exists the Council of Federation from by provincial premiers. United States, the Council of States, governments, and also Mexico with the National Conference of Governments. But this is a very recent experience in Brazil. This forum of governments only exists since uh, 19, uh, 2017. And, and the novelty in comparative perspective are the interstate consortia. I would say this is an unintended consequence created by the Bo Bolsonaristas uh, uh, federalism. And why? Because how the federal government decided to abandon, to conflict, or, or to battle against the, the states, the states decided to create their own uh, tools of cooperation. Uh, and especially since uh, 2019, uh, I would say that the whole states are participated at least in one interstate consortium. It's a very interesting, very novel uh, uh, experience in Brazil. Some lessons of Brazilian case, sectoral and horizontal cooperation model. Uh, there are 29 states and municipal cooperative councils formed for, for by secretaries uh, in order to influence or to do intergovernmental lobby. Uh, they try to influence, they try to influence, um, they try to influence the federative debate, protect their autonomy as well as exchange information and policy diffusion. Councils and forums uh, being, being a arena for articulation, agreement, and dissemination of information influence the process of formulating public policies. Intermunicipal consortia, which are predominantly organized on sexual and multi-purpose multi -purpose, uh, basis. And finally, intermunicipal consortia produce effects in the implementation of public policies since it seeks uh, to compensate uh, uh, via or through economy of scale, the administrative, technical, and financial local deficit. So I would say this is a, uh, for example, in Brazil, we have, uh, we know, uh, 5,570 municipalities, uh, and, and we have 4,000 municipalities to participate at least in one sectoral consortium. This is a very relevant and also influenced by one federal law. The whole consortium must obey the same rules defined by one um, federal law. So, additional comments. I, I try to to, uh, to to run away. Oh, uh, uh, so yeah, to run away from my own slides. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Brazilian has advanced in vertical sectoral uh, cooperation since 1988, uh, and it works to let has a federal safeguards to avoid uh, so, uh, federal government's encroaching. Uh, the federal government has attributions of coordination, regulation, and financing, and assert its powers of the poor. States and cities are relevant actors that participate in the federative cooperation arrangement, but are dependent on federal transfers. 
Many states and cities have less qualified bureaucracies, which makes the relationship with the federal, the federal government uh, more asymmetrical, uh, how Fernando Abruzzo told us yesterday afternoon. Despite the progress in the federative cooperation, it's a model with ascendance uh, at the federal uh, uh, government close to the Australian case. Where, where, where is Alan? Uh, thank you, there, my name is Swiss ones. <laughs> And additional comments. Uh, these formal forums and their advantages. Uh, as Johanna said, reliability and, re reliability and continuity, less dependency on political will, uh, partnership and autonomy protection. This is true for, for the Brazilian case. And, but uh, there are debatable and weak points. I, I, I will highlight at least two. However, federal government and constituent units sometimes circumvent these arenas. So there is, I would say, some kind of shirking, some kind of uh, um, uh, overburdening. So it's not exactly works in order to protect, uh, in fact, the autonomy of, of the constituent units. Um, and based on the federal design, informality is not the best option. See the education case. So in this case, Responding to Johanna, yes, in the case of Brazil, I would say that for the formal sectors, uh, I, I think it uh, uh, would work better to establish uh, our uh, uh, way to organize intergovernmental relations. What is the role for federal government, regulation and inducements, rules, funding, and technical support? Ensuring federative symmetry, decentralizing responsibilities for subnational implementation, especially in welfare policies and federal government in uh, and its redistributive and coordinated role in a very unequal federation. What is the role of peak councils? Uh, we do not have this kind of council in Brazil. Mm. Maybe this could be a bad news, but the good news is the current federal government is trying or created since the last January, the so-called Council of Federation. And, and, I, and I really do believe that we will have the first experience in Brazil trying to put this uh, three levels of government on the table in order to establish partnership, intergovernmental relations, and so on. So this council will have a participation of the states, municipalities, and federal level. And probably this council of federations um, uh, will have a different behavior or different uh, 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 capacity to implement these agreements exactly because the states are participating different from the first experience 20 years ago uh, in an equal weight. But uh, I, 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 I will wait for the Brazilian officers to explain for us in more details this experience in maybe some in the next section. And, and finally, conclusions, uh, partnerships, Yes, in Brazil, we have um, different verticals in formal or informal councils working at the same time based on the different rules, based on different inducements from um, municipalities, states, uh, inducements from federal level, and so on. Hierarchical coordination, federal government in Brazil has an asymmetrical power to enforce laws and rules. Federal government also uh, have, I would say, it's a huge power of the poor and a strong financial incentives. And finally, uh, the bottom-up characteristics. Uh, firstly, there are many horizontal and influential con councils and consortia. And IGR departments do not have a strong role. And finally, politics and in, in, in informal consults also matter in our uh, working um, uh, the way how intergovernmental relations works in our Brazilian Federation. So that's it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Eduardo, for the very detailed presentation, uh, very comprehensive. So we, we have about half an hour for questions uh, and answers. So please, Eleni. So thank you for your presentation. Um, uh, my name is Elaine. I work for the federal government. Um, uh, I'd like to to question uh, about uh, the role of bureaucracy in the middle of all of this, because um, of course uh, I'm talking about uh, the big councils perspective, as um, that's my object now in federal government, 
Uh, of course, political leadership is necessary for this kind of uh, council. But uh, what about bureaucracy? Um, I mean, uh, I've been watching all the presentations since yesterday, and I was thinking about as a bureaucrat and um, how can we uh, analyze, for example, in the um, perspective of conditions for success? Um, that's uh, uh, my, my question here. Um, how do you consider bureaucracy and, um, and its role? Because um, it's, uh, as, our, uh, as we are thinking Brazilian model, and I will speak about it later, uh, it's a very important, the bureaucracy, the bureaucracy, not only for um, the implementation of the decisions, but also in preparing the decision pro um, process. Mm -hmm. And um, it also can make a difference in the treatment of the divergences and the differences between the points, different perspective. Uh, I mean, we have uh, a lot of experiences in Brazil and in intergovernmental conditions, uh, which are um, leaded by bureaucrats. And so uh, I think uh, we had a lot, of, a lot of learning about this, and I think we can use this in this big um, council that we are creating now. So I would like to hear. Uh, um, your perspective about this, because I didn't see it considered, at least as, as far as I understood the, your models. And of course, Eduardo also knows our debate here and our difficulties. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, that's that's an, a very important point that you that you raised. I would maybe like to take a step back first um, and. Uh, take the, the liberty of responding a little bit to what Eduardo said, but I think it's also important to um, what, what you asked about. And I think um, it's very important to distinguish two things here. One, um, one question is public policy in general and the division of, of powers and the way representative government works and the fact there's an executive branch, there's legislative branch, there's bureaucracy. Um, that's that's very important. That's something that uh, an issue that exists in all countries. Now, in a federation, we have situations, and whether it's because there's a national unified system of health, I think it's called, or um, or there are other kind of, of interdependencies that need to be managed. And then we have IGR. So, for the national unified system of health, is a system. It's not IGR, right? That's very uh, to me. That's very very important to distinguish and the question is does this system um, exist and somehow work or does is RGR organized in such a way I'm just picking these as examples of course it's there are many other aspects that, that like do governments interact and work together in such a way that this system is managed effectively and so my um, I'm not an expert on public management so I cannot really answer your question about what is the role of bureaucracy in general course I can say something about what is the role of bureaucracy in in IGR and I would say here there are two um, two, two roles uh, one is that bureaucracy plays a very informal uh, based in, uh, a very important informal role and we know, we know this from other countries if um, bureaucrats interact on a daily basis and have good networks good working relationships that's very very conducive to to intergovernmental relations and obviously also to the effective implementation of um, of, of, of policy and we know and Yvonne Hegele has done a lot of work on that it's very difficult actually to get data <laughs> because you need to talk to people and you need to have people who are willing to to talk to you um, and she has shown that uh, in, in so she worked on on Germany that there's very close contact between uh, officials working in the different ministries in the in the core executives and that ranges from um, from let's say more or less official meetings to phone calls, they talk to each other, and it's especially, especially bureaucrats working either in the same sector or belonging to the same party or having gone to the same university. So this this is very important. There's also there's a book that was uh, written on on Canada. We know this from Switzerland. It's very important that the bureaucracy has means of of interacting, and yeah, that can occur informally, but in a way that 
it's down to I don't know luck I guess whether they do or, or not you might have a friend who works in another ministry and might might talk to them but um, this th those interaction can also be fostered through more informal means and for instance and Eduardo talked about this if I understood it correctly I think he called it ma managerial committees um, but usually intergovernmental councils have what is called either working groups, executive committees, or something which are meetings of bureaucrats. It can be deputy ministers or heads of heads of department within a ministry who would meet before the politicians meet to make uh, to, to reach decisions. And we know that they, these are very important because that's that's where they actually try to identify what can be done, where is room for compromise or, or agreement, and which are the contentious issues. And usually, politicians will then discuss. Those those issues or might also disregard them. That, that of course happens as well. But so I I would say if let's say I, I should add another uh, condition for success is to have a structure and a, f a formal structure within the council. If you establish a council of federation, make sure there are, there are working committees covering different important areas and potentially one executive committee that has a cross sectoral perspective that meets on a more regular basis, more frequent basis than uh, than the the uh, governors and the president. I hope that answers your question. And I'll hand over to Eduardo. No, we have. Uh, we have one question from this uh, YouTube audience uh, to you, Johanna. Johanna, uh, would the argument for or against formalized IGR change depending on the maturity of the federal system? Then why, why, why don't you answer this and then we go to the other one? Okay, I was hoping there would first be another question. <laughs> I can think about this a little bit because that that is actually a very, a very good question. Um, and I yeah I I don't really know. I guess I I would say that it ne doesn't necessarily depend on the maturity of the, the federation, the federal system, but potentially on the the legal what's it called legal culture, um, and. For instance, and uh, obviously this is the example of Germany because that's, <laughs> that's where I'm from. Germany is a very legal system. You can say this here in, when you interact with international scholars, like the time is written down, therefore we stick to it. <laughs> you stick to it. And you can see that reflected in, in IGR as well. Now, Canada has a different legal culture and you can see this in the way IGR work. And, and not, so in, in, my, um, in my book I published on IGR, I looked at Australia, Canada, Germany, and Switzerland, and I find that Australia and Canada work in a more similar way than Germany and Switzerland, which is not surprising because of their, their legal culture. So I think the, le the legal culture um, certainly matters. And I, I can imagine the majority of the Federation, potentially now come to think about it, probably matters in the sense that creating these mechanisms for them to work effectively and efficiently also takes some time to, to evolve. Again, it's not surprising that I found that IGR work more or less are more or less developed in Australia, Canada, Germany, and Switzerland, where they have existed for, for a very long time and not so well in Zebilak <laughs> would would uh, would confirm in, in Ethiopia, for instance. That's my assumption. Please don't uh, quote me on that. So the, the question, if I understand it correctly, is whether it would be more important to have formalized RIGR in um, newly emerging federations than in, in the more established federation. I would say you can you, you could argue that it's more important to have formalized IGR in uh, new federations because you need to, let's say, coerce people into working together in a federation where governments are used to work together. They are probably also more likely to, to, to do that, whether there is, there is a formal, formal institution 
or not at the same time and i think that this what i, what I mentioned earlier it's also important to have enough flexibility and potentially coercing people into doing something they don't want to do uh, usually and it's probably simple psychology also doesn't doesn't work work that well so my, my uh, suggestion would be to have so something in between with, with let's say regular meetings but also have having the possibility to um yeah to, to respond more flexibly to to certain situations i think what what is probably very important is to make sure that both orders of government can uh, can request meetings and can put forward uh, items on on the agenda so a lack of flexibility or let's say a high level of formalization where the federal government um, organizes meeting be they, they on a very regular and frequent basis with a highly formalized agenda but it's all dominated by the federal government to me it's more disruptive um, or is it the, the larger problem than the question of formalization um, yeah Good. Thank you. Jared. Um. I, ha I have a, a couple comments, if that is okay. I was, yeah, yeah, go ahead. I, I, I won't go ahead. be too long, but if it's okay, then no, I'll we have take time. the liberty. Okay, time. good. Then I'll take that liberty. Because on the one hand, thank you again for, for two wonderful presentations that I think are also very important um, for a lot of different reasons. Um, one, one sort of comment or just a reflection, food for thought, Back to Johanna. Um, well, so, one second. First, so I really enjoyed and admire also the, how both of you uh, are crystal clear in your presentations. I mean, and you were very, again, also now in the discussion, providing a very clear outline, you know, how to, how to attribute things and categorize things. Um, I have a tendency to complicate probably some things. I would complicate a number of things, which doesn't have to have any influence on your your thinking. But but coming back to sort of the relationship to democracy, I do wonder if there's something, and here's that you know that knot of strands, right? That I about federalism, democracy interacting. It seems to me that IGR is also a form of voice, isn't it? To think so, not just as sort of a control and a way of efficiency and output, but it's also input. It's a very participatory way to jump around. I remember, uh, 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 Daniel, you quoted uh, Bolsonaro with more Brasilia, but less, uh, uh, more Brazil, but less Brasilia. This reminds me of some of the populism from the US, where they also had not just one Bolsonaro, but a couple in the last decades. Uh, uh, before him with Reagan and the sort of anti-Washington is sort of Washington DC's a similar battle, but the irony of this situation is decoupling, you know, having these watertight compartments can open a door more easily to dominance from the national level, um, whereas a participatory mode of those constituent units at multiple levels, and then we get into that area of complicating whether we're talking about centralization or decentralization. Well, if multiple levels are working together, it's somewhere in between. Next footnote, I really liked that Rosario used a different dualism, not centralization and decentralization, but centrifugal and centripetal. And it would seem, regardless of which federal system we're talking about, we should, from a democratic standpoint, want some form of centripetalism and not too much disunity, if, if I could say that. So that's sort of, not that I have to convince this group, but it seems to be a positive argument for IGR, also from a democratic standpoint, it's participation in the Federation. So that's just food for thought, concretely, Johanna, for what it's worth, adding to what are some of the positives or, uh, about IGRs. In addition to the outcome orientation, it's also input, it's voice. Um, I think you said that already in, in so many words, but maybe it's a little point cherry on top. Yeah if that works. I, uh, the other thing I had to think about, and this is just food for thought, again, for what it's worth, if I remember your name, Gabriel, uh, you, you asked this question the last round about what citizens want and not. I think we have a difficult issue with transparency. This is not so good for practical terms, but in an academic arena, I think one of the issues we're dealing with is not transparency. I think many IGRs, many multi-level governance arenas work very transparent, especially nowadays in digital arena. 
you can download so many protocols and documents. The issue is who has time to read all this, right? <laughs> I mean, we write dissertations and postdoc theses about this, but no normal citizen does this. I'm just nitpicking as food for thought. I don't think it's lack of transparency oftentimes that's the issue, but it's the complexity. It's very difficult. I'm not saying it's not an issue. Of course, that can be an issue as well, lack of transparency. But oftentimes, even if they are completely transparent and translucent and everybody has access, nobody has time to understand all of that. Um, Jared, sorry, there are three yeah. other questions. So if uh, you don't mind uh, either asking a question or continuing a okay. discussion. No, that's uh, why I was careful asking. Yeah. It's a comment, sure. okay. Yeah, yeah, but so then, so I'll, so then I'll stop. I guess then real quick, one question then more concretely. Um, Sorry, I was just reflecting some things and yeah, connecting no, no, some no, no, points. Fine. His hands are going up. Okay, so I'll stop. I'll stop. <laughs> then the, the last and final question, um, Eduardo. Um, what what kind of political system? The, the short question is: What kind of political system do they have at the state level in Brazil? Is it also presidential systems? Yeah. So this makes me wonder at all if moving forward for the council that you're thinking about designing, if the German model is appropriate. I have serious doubts that it is. You spoke about picket fence federalism, and I think you're exactly right. Also, moving forward, it's going to have to be some kind of inclusion of not just chief executives. That doesn't work in a presidential system. You'll need the legislative councils, probably bureaucrats as well. That was part of the picket fence model, was including those who are actually doing the nuts and bolts of policy work, the executives, and then the parliaments or legislatures that have to agree to that because they don't have a vote of confidence that they can pressure their legislatures into accepting these agreements they want. So I think my hunch is, the question mark is, what do you think? You might need a more picket fence model than a sort of Canadian or German executive dominated model. Uh, okay, that's it. So I think what we'll do is we'll, we'll collect questions and then, and then you can answer them. So uh, Norbert, Elizabeth, and somebody had their hand up. Uh, oh, and okay, <laughs> so we've got, okay. So. Yeah, it goes, goes into the same direction. Um, the question is for me, I mean, the, the German model is very much within the executive, and there is, nothing, there is nothing going out. I mean, you even said transparency is not there, is everything included? Uh, sometimes these are informal networks and so on. So, um, and the question for me, the, and then you had this, these other models, which are quite nice. I 100% support this idea of rotation, rotational chairs and not having the... The, the higher hierarchy the, in the in the as a as a in the driver's seat, because if you have the federal in the federal in these systems, if you have the the the, the state level at the driver's seat and not the not the uh, the the federal level, then it gives a total different uh, thing. You see that in a lot of committees, what we are analyzing. So having this kind of rotation or or joint chairing things or. That is definitely another uh, another step, but it's it's not open and it's still in the executive only. Not even I mean not even parliamentary. There is no connection to parliaments, not even to citizens, not not to local or to local municipalities. And that's the question to you. At the, I don't know. I mean, how this is um, so different than for us also to see that you are including also local government associations or who, how do you select this this. Uh, the, the municipalities. I mean, are they say, from the associations, or do you say, okay, the mayor of Sao Paulo has to be in there? Yeah. So it's or and you mentioned also users. I mean, that means citizen. So how do you select that? Random selection is now on the agenda everywhere. I mean, how do you do that, or is it are they elected? Yes. So, uh, Elizabeth. Uh, before uh, Elizabeth asks a question, I for the international participants here. I want to introduce uh, Professor Vincente Trevas, who uh, was the brains behind thinking about intergovernmental relations, oh. uh, the, uh, how should I say, the grand doyen of uh, intergovernmental relations uh, and interaction in, in Brazil. So I'm very glad that uh, Vincente could join us. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Good. Yeah, in the floor. Yeah, thank you first uh, for the two presentations, very insightful. Um, I have one very technical question uh, and then uh, two comments, but short. Uh, so the technical question relates to the uh, so-called powers or competences, uh, com commune powers or competences. I was wondering, I mean, they relate to administrative um, issues, but I was wondering, 
uh, then who can actually occupy the 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 field so is it is it i mean if one level of government acts the other one cannot act anymore or uh, does it act next next to it or does it act and fill in what the other gov level of government doesn't do so this is uh, the very very technical <laughs> question let's say in the distribution of powers and technicalities of that um, the the first comment is goes in the direction of uh, of the lack or or not lack of transparency jared also related and um i wonder or um I think there is a lack of transparency very often. Obviously, IGRs are so different in every context that really depends. But I think also what is uh, linked to the lack of transparency is also the fact that IGR bodies, mechanisms, platforms within themselves, between themselves, do lack of coordination. I mean, that that sometimes I'm just thinking of one example. You have an IGR body that doesn't then relate or uh, basically communicate, uh, um, give information to the parliament and vice versa. And then you really end up what Norbert also was, I think, if I got it right, pointed to that you have a bit of a chaos of communication, coordination, and so on and so forth. Also, like, horizontally, there's a lack of transparency communication between IGRs, uh, whatever the bodies and so on are. And uh, the third, and I think we come to that, um, to me it seems, I'm really looking forward to hear more details, that uh, the plan council, having in also the third, la the third level of government, the lo localities, the municipalities, is pretty much similar to the conference system of Italy, where you have uh, either the conference system includes all three levels of governance, sometimes it includes only two, and so on and so forth. So it's interesting uh, to see how, uh, how, how you will discuss the details on that. We have two more questions. So. Um, thank you both for the wonderful presentations again. And um, so I have one question for you, Eduardo, regarding um, discretionary intergovernmental transfer. So as you know, I'm interested in um, budget amendments. And um, I think one of the discussions after the approval of the or something secret or the secret budget was that so first in the in the budget amendments at first, before they became in positive, they were very much shifted, like the power was very much in the executive. So the the really the executive had the power to decide uh, who like who would get the money to fund the specific projects and who were the deputies that would have this money. And then you had sort of an equilibrium when they became in positive. And then um, sorry, before they they became in positive, you had the executive and then sort of an equilibrium between both when um, deputies had the discretion to to um, sort of send out this money, but they still had to be. Uh, they had this uh, fixed budget determined by the uh, by the budget commission, and then now with the secret budget, you have very much the the power in the hands of the legislative, and especially Artur Lira. And um, but still, this is all this is always in the in the federal level, and so you have deputies and local level bureaucrats and politicians having to fight for this money, and obviously the the bargaining between these powers isn't equal, and obviously the money doesn't go to the places where they need the most, but where um, these political relationships exist um, in a better way. So I think the, qu the question might be a hard one, but do you think that there is any way in which uh, we could redesign these policies of intergovernmental transfers in a way that would be actually participatory or fairly participatory for municipalities not depending necessarily on who has the, be the best political connections or, or who are the bureaucrats that are more well connected or have the most money to sort of offer um, electoral returns for these deputies who guarantee um, funding for a specific project. It's a question to Eduardo. It has to do with the somewhat informal instruments that can be used to coordinate 
federal TV agent or constituent units. And I was thinking about, in the Brazilian specific case for municipalities, uh, the two organizations that represent mm -hmm. municipalities. Mm -hmm. Three, in fact. Wow. Yeah, I was thinking about the National Front of Mayors. Uh, it was founded exactly one year after the new constitution that mm -hmm. established municipalities as federative units was, uh, uh, was framed. And the Brazilian Association of Municipalities. Mm -hmm. That uh, goes to the forest. Of the the of okay, there is the third one. But I was thinking about these two, considering uh, the role of the of the second one, actually the oldest one, during the framing of the constitution to establish municipalities there as constitutive units. They were responsible for a very strong lobby at that time, together with the Faria Lima Foundation that framed the main ideas uh, concerning that. And they are still there. They're still there, they work all the time, uh, claiming for municipalities' uh, demands at the federal level. If we don't have a very formal uh, council to, to, to work, mm -hmm. we have, on the other hand, this kind of political pressure of these associations of public agents in both cases. And I think perhaps it could be considered to your model, mm -hmm. considering uh, we're not talk talking about <laughs> Social, civil society, but uh, it looks like a civil society mechanism, but that has to do not with civil society itself, but with subnational governments. And so it is interesting to think about that. Thank you very much. So we have about 10 minutes. So what I'll do is, uh, Johanna, you can have five minutes to address uh, the, the questions you've got, and then the water will hand over to you. Please go ahead. Thank you. Well, those were more comments than questions. No? <laughs> That's when Germans don't stick to their rules. I think that <laughs> kidding. Um, I, I mean, Jerry pointed out, yeah, that that's I, I can agree with all of this. But maybe for the sake of um, of debate, I think what we should potentially consider is that there might be a trade off. And I mean, not that I I am against transparency, but of course, transparency, parliamentary scrutiny, and and so on are further. Uh, aspects that slow down the, the whole process. So imagine if you have an, an IGR meeting, and then first you need to make sure that everything is transparent, parliaments need to get involved, civil society needs to get involved, then, I mean, it takes very long to take decisions as it is, so including more actors will, will slow down, which doesn't mean that th they should not be, be included, but that is would be a price to pay, so I guess it's also about finding the right balance between who to include. Now, I also would say that in in parliamentary systems, um, you, you could take a shortcut and say that whatever is, that the governments are participating in the meetings are elected by, by parliaments and are accountable to those parliaments. That's not the case in a presidential system. At the same time, even in a presidential system, those bodies can decide whatever they want. It still needs to be based on legislation or there need to be legislation that's going to be adopted by uh, by parliament, so in a way to bring parliaments in, even though they don't participate in in meetings. What I think is is very important is what you said about voice, and that's true. IGR offer more voice to both orders of, of government, and I I find it quite interesting. I think it highlights the point is that Germany, which and Antonio is going to talk about this uh, shortly, Germany, which has a very strong second chamber where the constituent units, the governments of the constituent units, are represented, which is not the case. Of all the other second chambers, also has a very well-developed uh, intergovernmental relations uh, system. So I think that's that's very important. It just further highlights um, your point. And then I would also like to um, strengthen, I think you said that, Elisabeth as well, I forgot that potentially looking at uh, Germany or Canada might not be very useful for, for Brazil when it comes to designing this the Council of the Federation. I think the countries to look at are the US, of course, because it's a presidential system. Germany, uh, sorry, not Germany, but uh, Switzerland, because it has a conference of cantonal governments. That's a whole cabinet are members of uh, of the the conference. So all the min the ministers as well, and then they decide depending on certain rules of who who will actually attend the meetings. And then I know now, now it's a pity that Alan left because um, in uh, in Australia, and I always mix it up. Either Coreg or national cabinet has. Uh, membership of local government, which is not the case in in the other one, so that might might be a place to to look at. But otherwise, I I would 
suggests looking at countries like like Switzerland. Um, yeah, I hope I covered everything. Okay, thanks. Well, thank you for for your comments and, and questions. It's quite interesting. And well, firstly, uh, chair, that I would say that. Uh, in Brazil, we refer to our federalism, such as one model um, characterized as a, a decentralized and participatory federation or federalism. So in this case, uh, if you remember uh, uh, yesterday, Marta reminded us that we have a lot of powerful actors, so-called uh, public policy councils acting and each level of government, at municipal level, state level, and federal level. So that's to say that we have different, uh, I would say, uh, uh, different uh, ways of uh, governance acting in different levels of government. So this is a way to control uh, in many policies there are social actors, at least formally speaking, having the power to control uh, mayors, uh, governors, and even at the federal level, many policies must be approved by this course in order to be implemented. Uh, for example, in the case of uh, health policy, for sure, the ministry has a lot of power, the powers of the poor, uh, it has the power to define the national policy to implement, but also the National Council has a strong power in order to approve the national health plan. So in this case, I would say that even if our federation is organized according to the sectoral lines, we do not need to worry about that, putting these words and why. Because also we have some administrative agreements aside to these public, public councils working together with social actors. And these both instruments uh, uh, work at the same time, influence each other. The administrative one and also this governance model working. So balancing the capacity to, for example, to reduce perhaps the enforcement of the government or, or, or controlling from the society acts from the government. Okay. I don't know if I if I answer your question, but basically this is our uh, our our the way how our federation works, okay? So about your question, um, Norbert, yes, uh, first of all, uh, through representatives indicated by these national councils, representing municipalities or state governors, and um, in including this, uh, this uh, 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 inter-managerial uh, inter commissions, or even in states, present, uh, in the case of health and social justice, decides by consensus. And they have the same numbers of representatives. In the case of health, uh, five members representing municipalities, five members representing states, and five members representing the federal government. And uh, this uh, council must decide by consensus. So, and each each municipality, uh, each municipal representative from uh, uh, coming from one uh, different regions in Brazil, south, southeast, and center west, and the like. So this is, in the case of users, is more complicated. And why? Because maybe uh, 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 here there are some politics at work. Uh, in fact, in fact, who knows if these representatives are in fact representatives from the society? So uh, there is a lot of discretion because this, the the the, the way how these these representatives are indicated or nominated depending on the political wiling or depending on the political disposition from the federal government, you know. So uh, this this not necessarily they represent. In fact, uh, I would say uh, it's uh, the political view or the political position. So, but anyway, this is the way how this uh, multi-level government works in, in health and also in social system. And, and, and uh, I would say, Elizabeth, that in fact, even if uh, this uh, one article, specifically speaking, the um, um, one article defining uh, the set of these uh, uh, common uh, competences in, in health education, 
uh, child, on a, child care, uh, elderly environment, that I, I don't remember the list of uh, these competencies. The point is, it's very good, it's very difficult to think that in, in, in the federation, such as Brazil, that the Federal Government Act will assume the implementation of any public policies. In fact, the responsibility is uh, charged, uh, is in charge by the municipality. So in this case, the Federal Government acts uh, inducing the municipalities to adhere to their own policies, uh, using the power of the poor, or regulating, uh, defining new uh, administrative rules, or even just transferring the bird to the municipalities. One example. In one constitutional amendment in, in 2000, uh, the federal government decided, oh, I think it's going to be a good idea to define that municipalities must spend 50% of their budgets in health. Oh, what's going on? But municipalities did not decide that. And why did the, the federal government decide to do it? Because it's the way to say, oh, this is a common responsibility. You must spend, you must spend 50% of the, your budget in this policy, and that's it. So, in general, I would say, technically speaking, the federal government also can intervene in this area, but in, in practice, the municipalities are in charge of implement this. But in other case, maybe federal government can circumvent these arenas. For example, in the case of the the, the, so, the program so called. Uh, uh, more doctors, the, the federal government deciding and 10 years ago to implement without consulting these arenas. And why? Because the, 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 the social pressure against the federal government asking more high quality service, public service, and, 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 and Juma's president uh, thought, no, maybe we don't have enough time uh, uh, to build one agreement involving this institution. So uh, the federal government decided unilaterally uh, implement these public policies, just transferring money to the municipalities. So in practice, municipalities are in charge to implement this common, uh, the so-called common competences. And, and, and also conference, uh, I, I, I think you mentioned, conference is a very, uh, another relevant way to guarantee the participation from municipal and state representatives in, in the definition of many public policies. I do not remember if one in the audience could help me. How many conferences we have in Brazil, do we have in Brazil? I do not remember. Maybe I would say, I don't know, uh, 20 different sectors uh, uh, um, implementing different, uh, uh, this kind of uh, agreements. And, and again, this is a way how the civil society can participate in order to influence or, or, or maybe to define some general guidelines to different public policies, including health, uh, for example. This is, I, I would say that maybe dialogue and if you, this is a way to implement uh, innovative uh, tools of participation in our federation. So, and finally, uh, not finally, but considering the question from Isabella, I would say, Isabella, that in Brazil, uh, we have a, a very formal tools to transfer conditional and unconditional transfer. For example, the most known conditional is this the municipal municipal participatory fund, or even the same in the states, or the conditionals or year market uh, transfers in the case of health and education. So, uh, 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 the volume of, of of money available to to do politics. It's, it's, it, I would say it's lower than the amount of money transfer based in a condition or unconditional ways. For sure, you have politics in this case. And for sure, this, the secret budget uh, diminished the, 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 the level of transparency. But I am not sure that we can compare the amount of money composed by uh, uh, conditional and unconditional transfers with the amount of money available to the representative, especially of uh, deputies, deputies to do this kind of, uh, I would say, uh, in order to, to influence the way how these intergovernmental fiscal relations in fact works. I don't know, it is my, my opinion. And I agree with you, Claude, including I mentioned in the beginning of my presentation the role of the so-called intergovernmental lobby. In fact, these are very relevant factors. These three municipal, these three national uh, associations representing municipalities in our federation. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much for the presentations and the questions. I'm just going to take uh, by uh, 
uh, take advantage of my position as the moderator, because I, I was thinking a little bit about a lady's question, the difference between what politicians do at an apex forum and what, uh, what bureaucrats should be doing. Uh, you know, to me, the bureaucrats have three functions. They are the sectoral experts. And so they have to feed their political masters the, the, uh, the technical information that they need to make informed decisions. I think for the council, uh, the, 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 the secretary that supports the council is also the keeper of the processes by which agendas are developed and how meetings are run. Because politicians will come and go, the secretariat is, I imagine, will be, will be permanent. And of course, last but not the least, uh, is of course the implementation of uh, of decisions taken. Uh, you know, technical committees led by bureaucrats cannot cannot take decisions that are outside of the frame. I mean, that is the job of politicians who are either responsible to parliament or, or the or the people. And in that context, if you see the uh, COAG, you know, COAG publishes its uh, its agenda, and it publishes action taken reports where it, it designates specific committees of secretaries and uh, you know, deputy secretaries to, to do follow-up. Uh, the, other, the other issue that came up is that of transparency, and this comes up all the time. Uh, and you know, my, my view on this is I very much agree with uh, Joanna's view that I think it's, there has to be some level of, uh, I don't want to say informality, but, but flexibility. Uh, managing intergovernmental relations or uh, interdependencies is an art, not a science. And I think the politicians at the apex level will have a very good sense of when they need to work uh, you know, outside of the public eye and when they need to go outside and involve uh, you know, their constituents. And so again, there I, you know, I, I think it really is, is highly contextual. So with that, I will uh, close this session. Thank you very much, for everyone, for your participation and questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. And for sure, obrigado. I confused. It, it, it should be gracias. It should be gracias. I confused.
Okay. No, not, not your time yet. Now I have a different role now <laughs> here. Well, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, now we have not the last, but one of the last sections of the seminar. And uh, we will have the, the exposition of uh, Dr. Olavo Noleto. Olavo Noleto, he is the, well, Executive Secretary of the Ministry of Institutional Relations. The, the, the position of Executive Secretary corresponds in Brazil to a kind of Vice Minister. We don't have this denomination, but it works exactly like that. Uh, and so I, will, I want to, to call Olavo to, to, to the table. And we have also Eleni Lissu, that works also in the Ministry of Institutional Relations. We don't have a chair. We need a, another chair. Uh, Thank you. Okay. And so, and, and also we have here Katarina Yannick, and Katarina will help us with the concomitant translation of uh, uh, what uh, Dr. Olavo will say. And so, please, it's our time. Boa tarde a todas, a todos. Som. Boa, boa tarde a todas, a todos. É um prazer estar aqui. Agradeço a Catarina pela tradução desse caipira que vos fala aí. Depois ela vai traduzir o termo caipira para quem é de fora. <risos> Yeah. Well, uh, I think I should start because now everybody was laughing and I should explain, but he said, like, good good afternoon, and I, I will try to help with the translation. And he said, like, oh, I am a uh, uh, redneck, but it's redneck, not exactly perhaps. a redneck. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, yeah but it's like, yeah, he's Come. from the countryside <laughs> and he doesn't speak English, but I think it's great because he knows Brazil and it's what, what matters. <laughs> Cumprimentar toda o corpo aqui dos professores, de gente da, da Fundação Getúlio Vargas, agradecer é, pelo apoio, pelo trabalho, pelo convite, cumprimentar é, o Rupac, em nome dele, o, todo o Fórum das Federações, cumprimentar os estudiosos, é, aqui em nome do Green, cumprimento a todos, do, do Abrúcio, e eu peço licença sempre para cumprimentar um mestre, é, Vicente Trevas, que para nós, militantes, é, o Trevas é uma referência de vida, uma referência na política e nos ensinamentos, aí, inclusive, principalmente sobre o federalismo. O pouco que eu me atrevo a falar é, tem raiz nos ensinamentos do mestre Vicente Trevas. Então, eu peço essa licença para fazer a referência ao mestre. Acho que é sempre bom honrar os nossos mestres, né? Uh, uh, yeah, I, I think I can start. So he just thank everybody, the Forum of Federations, also Eduardo Green, Fernando Abruzio, and especially Vicente Trevas, uh, that for for <laughs> for for him uh, for him yeah, that is from the uh, the the political um, political. Uh, work is Trevas is a reference of life and teaching about federalism. And and he taught everything he knows. And that he's a master. <laughs> <laughs> Nós temos no Brasil é, sempre o desafio de um olhar mais estratégico é, numa disputa de projeto de país é, em contraposição a olhares é, casualísticos. É, pontuais e que alimentam uma cultura é, clientelista, inclusive, no mundo da política. É, não é, nunca é bom falar assim do seu próprio país, mas nós estamos num espaço de reflexão em que essa disputa sempre vai estar presente. Falar em federalismo no Brasil é parar para pensar o Estado brasileiro, que Estado nós queremos. Talvez em outros países o debate das teses sobre o arranjo do Estado Nacional possa se dar é, em outras formas. Aqui a disputa, eu me atrevo a dizer que, um, tirando um universo de pensadores, de formuladores, 
quando você vai para o mundo da política, a formulação não é tão rica e nesse mundo da política ela, muita, ela normalmente é muito casual. Ela não é algo de um pensamento estratégico. Esse é um ah, permissão. Ok, uh, so uh, it's a challenge to look uh, to have a strategic, uh, strategic, strategic view uh, in Brazil about uh, the project of the country and also thinking about the federalism. Um, he said that uh, in Brazil we have um, a casualistic view and also. Um, a, a culture that sometimes is clientelistic, uh, that uh, predominates in the world of politics. Uh, and then he said that uh, it's good to talk about, uh, it's not always, uh, it's not good to talk like this about our country, uh, but uh, we need to think about this, consider about, the, uh, about these characteristics to discuss the Brazilian case. And it's good to, to listen to other theses about the, the federalism in other countries. Uh, but here in Brazil, we need to consider this world of the politics and these features and dynamics of the politics here. Uh, that the formulation of policies are not always so rich and sometimes is casual and not a result of a strategic view. Incrível, né? A Catarina. <laughs> Hidden skills. <laughs> <laughs> Quando, em 2003, uh, o governo brasileiro e nós tivemos a a sorte de estar naquele momento ali, participar, e muito sobre a orientação do mestre Vicente Trevas. Nós criamos o Comitê de Articulação Federativa, na época, o CAF. É, em primeiro lugar, era uma mesa de negociação permanente com é, os prefeitos brasileiros ou com a representação dos prefeitos brasileiros. Mas, por trás daquilo, tinha algo muito elaborado e, e, pelo mestre Vicente, que era um lugar que nos obrigasse, é, na presidência da República, a pensar o Estado brasileiro. Então, isso não foi qualquer coisa. Foi um movimento estratégico que teria influência uh, grande nos anos seguintes para nós podermos a partir dessa intervenção é, cirúrgica, vou chamar assim, disputar um arranjo ou um amadurecimento de um caminho para o Estado brasileiro. So in 2003, uh, the Brazilian government had the, the luck to, to have the guidance of Vicente Trevas and create a, a committee of federative articulation, CAF, that was a, a, a permanent uh, table, a permanent group that negotiated um, with the representation of the mayors. Uh, and and behind it was an idea to think about the Brazilian case um, at the national level, at the presidency, uh, at the the national, the federal executive. Uh, this was uh, a strategic movement that influenced the following years, um, and then uh, from this intervention, uh, they could uh, develop this arrangement. Eu diria que agora o nosso desafio com a criação do Conselho da Federação é, seja é, na proporção do desafio que foi a criação do CAF naquele momento. Não será algo simples, não será algo fácil. É possível que nós depois venhamos avaliar que não estávamos maduros para essa para esse passo que nós estamos dando, mas é um passo necessário e é um passo estratégico no caminho de se estabelecer uma mesa tripartite dos chefes de governo e das, ou das representações de chefes de governo que permitam ir para além de uma mesa permanente de negociação, uma reflexão uh, e um amadurecimento tripartite dos rumos 
é, da construção permanente desse Estado brasileiro. É, o Conselho da Federação ele, ele se propõe a ser um novo grande passo uh, intragovernamental, claro, mas um, um, um passo consistente é, que nos permita, apoiados é, pela academia, apoiados é, por quem pensa é, o Estado brasileiro, é, constituir esse processo que é de negociação, mas que é de amadurecimento do arranjo é, institucional do nosso federalismo. Né? So uh, now the 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 current uh, the the current challenge is to create the the Council of Federation. Um, And he believes it's it's uh, the same challenge, it's a similar challenge than when the CAF was created. Uh, it won't be something easy. It won't be a a, a, a simple task. Uh, but in the future, maybe they will think that they were they were not at this moment mature to think to to do that. But this is strategic to establish this uh, this this table this table with representatives from the three levels of government. Uh, in this, in this, in this, com this permanent table, uh, with representatives from the 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 three levels of government uh, to negotiate and to to establish uh, a permanent and more um, con consistent uh, relationship uh, and uh, uh, and a construct uh, that, that will. Uh, guide the construction of the Brazilian state. Uh, this is uh, a, a step towards the build of an intergovernmental, uh, more consistent intergovernmental relations um, and supported by the, the, the university, the specialists, and supported by who thinks about the Brazilian state. Uh, it, All this was important, it, it has been important to, to build this process of negotiation and um, uh, 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 to, uh, to maturation and uh, maturation to to uh, the of the further the, the uh, arrangement of federalism in Brazil. O presidente Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva, o presidente Lula, ele quando decidiu encampar essa proposta, nós dissemos para ele que seria um começo é, delicado. O mestre Vicente sempre falou no encontro de agendas, né? porque uma mesa dessa é, é uma mesa em que não adianta nós virmos com uma posição é, unilateral da parte do governo e querer impor a agenda do governo para a mesa. É, o conceito de, de encontro de agendas, é, esse conceito, ele é a base é, principal para que nós possamos fazer dessa mesa uma mesa é, forte, uma mesa legítima e uma mesa é, que produza o, o, o próximo ambiente de pactuação é, do federalismo brasileiro no que se respeita às instâncias intragovernamentais. Então, é fundamental, nesse começo de trabalho, é, nós entendermos a importância de respeitar aquilo que vem dos entes subnacionais. Uh, so the president Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva uh, decided to to support this proposal. Um, they they uh, um, 
combined that this was the beginning. Uh, it, it was a delicate beginning. Uh, and the, the master of uh, Trevas um, said that it was the, uh, the, the uh, meeting of different agendas. So the table, uh, it's not to, to put the position, the unilateral position of uh, the federal government, so to impose a position and an agenda to the federal government, but to to have this this space to to uh, of meeting of different agendas. Uh, so this is the basic principle uh, for this table, and so this table could be strong and 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 have legitimacy. Uh, and could uh, be closer to uh, a space of negotiation, pactu pactuation, negotiation, uh, um, leading towards uh, uh, intergovernmental, uh, um, getting closer to an uh, intergovernmental arena. Um, yeah. uh, e, por fim, uh, Entender que existem uh, o, o, as diferenças intra-regionais e as assimetrias é, do conjunto dos entes federados, elas precisam é, estar constantemente sendo consideradas para que o processo de diálogo, ele não seja um processo em que a posição do grande, a posição do forte, prevaleça em detrimento da posição dos frágeis, vamos dizer assim. É, por isso, a, a delicadeza de nós constituirmos é, uma mesa que leve em consideração esses e tantos outros aspectos, uh, de maneira em que cada parte se sinta representada, de maneira que cada parte sinta que a mesa é para valer e de maneira que a mesa produza. Né? Porque tudo isso... É... Vou, vou voltar aqui. É... O CAF já era uma mesa difícil o Comitê de Articulação Federativa, ele já era uma mesa difícil, porque ali você já tinha, já tinha posições diferentes de entes, de perfis muito diferenciados, com pesos diferentes e com, e com vontades diferentes, é, com expectativas diferentes, né? e, e conflito de interesses das capitais, das grandes cidades, das cidades metropolitanas, dos pequenos municípios. Você já tinha ali um conjunto de uh, assimetrias, de diferenças, que estavam ali representadas e que a, a, a delicadeza, a condução, uh, na condução do CAF, permitiu que o CAF produzisse muito e, ao mesmo tempo, também é, não permitiu que produzisse mais. Porque é claro que a nossa avaliação é de que o CAF produziu muito, mas que poderia ter produzido muito mais. Né? E por que, que não produziu muito mais? Porque não é da vontade de uma parte, é do resultado. O resultado do encontro de agendas, o resultado das expectativas, daquilo que se tem sucesso numa mesa desse tipo. Então, é, não era algo fake, não era algo... Fake que está na moda agora a palavra, né? No... Simulado. É, não era algo de simulado, né? Era algo para valer. E esse algo para valer, claro, você tem sucessos e insucessos no processo. O CAF é um, uma super experiência que nos pauta, nos serve de referência para esse próximo passo que é, nós damos agora com a criação do Conselho da Federação. Uh, so uh, it's important to understand uh, that there is differences uh, uh, between regions and asymmetries in, uh, when we consider the the different um, governments in across the country, and they should be considered uh, in this process of dialogue. Uh, 
so the point is not to be a, a process in which there is one uh, strong uh, uh, one strong entity that that prevails in, um, in comparison to the others, but it's to build this table that consider the different aspects, uh, the different um, uh, interests, demands, and needs of all, um, and each part will feel uh, should be feel represented in this table. Uh, this table also should. Uh, be worth and should uh, have outcomes produce uh, decisions. Uh, so then he came back to to explain about the coffee that it was a difficult table. Uh, you had you had different positions uh, with different weights. So you have different uh, needs and and and, and conflicts of interests. Uh, because you have big cities and small municipalities, uh, you ha so you have asymmetries and differences, and they were all represented there. Uh, but the work of Kafi allowed to produce different decisions, uh, and didn't allow to produce more because of that, because it's a table with differences, and the and the table is and the decisions are the result of. Um, this uh, meeting of agendas, so this process of dialogue and negotiation. So it wasn't something fake, and then he said, like, fake is it's, it's something trending, but it, it was something um, really worth it, um, and, and it had succe uh, successful uh, decisions and process and dynamics, and also uh, process decisions, dynamics that were not su successful. Uh, but coffee now is, is, is it's the reference of this new process of creating uh, the uh, for uh, the the council of uh, <laughs> federation. federation. <laughs> Bom, por fim, é, nós uh, acreditamos que não nos cabe julgar, não nos cabe julgar outras experiências. É, mas acreditamos é, o, o caminho do, do federalismo de um país federativo para nós é uma aposta estratégica não é não é algo casual e é o conselho da federação ele é um mecanismo dessa aposta estratégica nós queremos que ele seja né, temos a intenção de que ele seja um espaço de diálogo, um espaço de construção, porque nós acreditamos, e aí é da nossa, da natureza, da nossa natureza, é do nosso DNA, é, o processo de construção coletiva é que vai permitir que um Estado tão diverso, tão assimétrico, um país tão, com tantas diferenças e tantas desigualdades, não poderia ser por outro caminho, então, nós tínhamos que almejar esse, sempre esse federalismo, a construção cada dia, a cada dia desse, de um federalismo cada dia mais maduro, mais potente, que consiga se coordenar melhor, se coesionar melhor. Mas essa construção também é, é importante dizer que a, que a caminhada é, não poderia ser outra que não pelo diálogo. Não se constrói algo. É, dessa natureza, dessa profundidade, é, numa, numa estratégia de, de Estado Nacional, é, unitário. A, a estratégia também teria que ser, é, a, o caminho também teria que ser é, aprofundando os mecanismos de diálogo, de cooperação, é, de amadurecimento, de construção coletiva. É, as várias partes têm que tem que participar desse amadurecimento, tem que amadurecer juntas. Né? Então, essa é uma, é uma, é uma aposta estratégica. É, a história depois vai dizer se essa vai ser uma contribuição efetiva para o fortalecimento do federalismo no Brasil, mas eu me atrevo a dizer, eu não sou um estudioso, eu não sou um mas eu me atrevo a dizer, como com a experiência política, que, que é o, o pouco que eu tenho, é, que vai ser uma contribuição muito efetiva e nós vamos poder 
fortalecer esse caminho de um país inclusivo, de, um, de, de uma democracia mais participativa, de entes nacionais, de entes subnacionais, é, em que a desigualdade entre eles, a gente possa perseguir a diminuição dessa desigualdade a cada dia, que se reflita no desenvolvimento regional, é, também com essa mesma preocupação, essa mesma lógica, e que, sim, o Conselho da Federação possa fazer parte da, da história do nosso país com muito carinho, com muita, muito respeito, mas com um olhar estratégico de permanente amadurecimento do, do nosso país, do, do Estado Nacional que nós estamos construindo. Nós temos uma equipe ali liderada pelo... Ah, por favor. Uh, uh, just I, I forgot to mention that he said of uh, being a, uh, the council uh, has uh, should be the place the space to have the representatives of subnational government. Uh, so then uh, he said now that uh, he, he, uh, he uh, they don't want to judge other experiences, but they believe that the path of the federalism. Um, this path of a federalism is a, a strategic um, choice. It's not something casual. The, the Council of Federation is a mechanism of this uh, strategic choice, as is a space of dialogue and construction. Um, a, a collective construction will allow uh, the development of, uh, the, the, uh, of a such diverse state, uh, asymmetric, with so many differences and inequalities. And uh, so uh, this, this couldn't be, uh, they couldn't choose another path. Uh, the federalism, uh, this federalism will be more, and uh, no, Brazil's federalism will be more potent, uh, po uh, more um, powerful, uh, but the, the, the pathway um, to, to achieve that is through dialogue. Uh, we don't view anything of this nature uh, with a uh, unitary uh, national state, uh, in the case of Brazil, of course. Uh, the pathway uh, is, to, is to develop this, this mechanism of dialogue, of cooperation, um, and of collective construction. Uh, and the parts, and then the different uh, parts, uh, sh should uh, get wiser together, let's say, uh, should, should develop together. Um, and so to, to strain Brazil, uh, he, uh, he, he, he says with his political experience that uh, this will be a, a, a effective contribution uh, to strain the path of a country uh, to, towards a more inclusive country with more with a stronger democracy par participative democracy and with uh, less inequality among subnational entities um, so the council will be part of this history um, I think so yeah <laughs> I think that's it Catarina além de né? de pesquisadora e tal, ela também é uma grande tradutora, né? <risos> né? Vamos ver. É... Now, now it's my time to translate. He said that Catarina, besides being a very, very good researcher, and she's also, this is my part, a professor of the political science department at University of São Paulo, their last acquisition from us, from us, <laughs> our alumni. Uh, she's also a terrible, terrific translator. <laughs> terrible. <laughs> not terrible, terrific. Sorry, sorry for my mistake. I'm not, a, I'm not as a good translator as her. <laughs> Bom, aqui no, uh, lá na nossa equipe, uh, o Ministério das Relações Institucionais, a Secretaria de Relações Institucionais da Presidência da República. Nós temos o ministro Alexandre Padilha, que é o ministro. E nessa estrutura uh, da SRI, nós temos a Secretaria Especial de Assuntos Federativos, hoje SEAF, meu coração ainda fala SAF, né? a gente chamava SAF, agora eu cheguei lá, a Bruce, os caras chamam de SEAF, deu uma dor no coração, mas enfim, aí é o nosso... É, então tem a, a, a SAF, a SEAF, tem uma área de relação com o parlamento, que é a Secretaria de Assuntos Parlamentares, CEPAR, 
nós temos lá uma secretaria executiva do Conselho de Desenvolvimento Econômico, Social e Sustentável, o Conselhão, o SEDES, né? É, e eu creio que é, o Conselhão estar é, no escopo uh, do trabalho da SRI é algo bom para o Conselhão, pela interface que é criada com a agenda federativa e do parlamento, agora é muito bom para o Conselho da Federação também estar ali é, pela, pela interface que é, vai ser possibilitada com a agenda no parlamento e com a agenda no Conselhão. Uh, então, as câmaras temáticas que nós vamos ter uh, no Conselho da Federação, e aproveito para para registrar aqui é, esses dois profissionais gigantes, né, a Elaine e o André, é, gigantes, gigantes, gigantes pela, pela pelo seu preparo, pela sua capacidade técnica, gigantes pela qualidade é, da articulação, a sensibilidade na articulação, gigantes por nos aguentarem, porque não é simples aguentar esses malucos aqui e poderem fazer o trabalho que estão fazendo para esse começo de caminhada, é, eu me atrevo a dizer que é, o, o que resta é, é que, com certeza, eles vão entrar para a história. Né? Então, isso é muito legal. E eles estão de parabéns, né? e essa equipe fantástica. A gente tem a sorte de fazer parte desse time, eu tenho a honra de poder estar tá ali com o ministro Padilha, podendo ajudar a construir, a liderar esse time, mas é, é um time fantástico. E eu tenho certeza que essa interface é, do Conselho da Federação com essas outras frentes de trabalho da SRI também vão enriquecer muito o que será o trabalho do Conselho da Federação nesse próximo período. E esse registro, para terminar, do agradecimento aí a, aos dois heróis da, construtores aí efetivos do dia a dia do Conselho da Federação, que na prática eles nos lideram, nos iluminam, nos trazem a sensibilidade, a sabedoria para o que está sendo construído no Conselho da Federação. Então fica esse registro, acho que aqui é o espaço correto para poder fazer esse registro que é tão merecido aí aos dois queridos profissionais né, e que nos é, aquecem nos ajudam muito ali, nos orientam muito. Eu acho que a gente tá, vai ter também, por isso, sucesso nessa empreitada que se inicia com o Conselho da Federação. Era um pouco isso para contribuir aqui, de, chutar uma bola para a reflexão de todos. aí. Muito obrigado. É... É bom que vocês elogiaram antes, que agora é complicou. Uh, now mm. it's, it's a bit complicated because he explained the the organ uh, the, orga the the organizational structure of the, the where the council is uh, the council is. So he said that uh, uh, the the staff of uh, the Ministry of Institutional Relations of the President uh, of the the Federal Executive, uh, Padilha. So they they are within this structure. Uh, there is also a, sec a secretary of federative uh, issues. Uh, Affairs, affairs uh, that it was that, that now is called Safi, but before it was Safi, um, and and then there is the relationship with the parliament that is uh, that, that who, who conducts that the the structure that conducts that is the secretar the sec secre secret secretary of uh, parliamentary affairs, affairs. also, uh -huh. separ. Uh, and also there is the secretary, executive secretary of the Council uh, of Econ Social, Economic and Sustainable Development. Um, that is the Conselhão. It's it's a, a very the big council. Yeah, 
the Great Council. Yeah. It's difficult to translate that. Uh, this council has representatives from civil from from civil society, so so has different representatives. So it's it's a very big council. Uh, so f for them, it's important to be in this uh, in this in this structure because they can dialogue with different actors, especially with the parliament. Uh, and then he thank uh, Andre and Leini, Eleni and Andre. Andre. Um, <laughs> that are and vice very, versa. Uh, yeah, <laughs> and that, uh, that, that they are very uh, important uh, and uh, well important uh, professionals that have a very uh, high technical quality uh, capacity, uh, and they are doing a great job. Um, and definitely, they will uh, they will be in history. Uh, so he he's very. Um, um happy or honored to 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 lead this team that is a very fantastic and and great team and and i think yeah and then the, he he thank uh both and all the team for um start this uh this this work together e obrigado a catarina né gente obrigado <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Kat. Thanks a lot, Secretary. And now we have Eleni Lisiu that will talk about the the Council of Federation that's being framed. No, or that was framed before and now that's being reframed. It's yes. Okay? Yes. And okay. Thank you. So I I'm also uh, think uh, I would like to say thank you to Eduardo and uh, Johanna and Rogério. Um, for the invitation to be part of this uh, absolutely um, great opportunity to learn from our colleagues from in the international perspective and also share our challenge that, as you see, is not small. <laughs> Actually, it's very big. <laughs> and um, I would like to thank you um, also Forum of Federations and the person of RUPAC that are they are help, helping us uh, since the very beginning that we arrived in the um, Ministry of uh, Institutional Relations. So uh, they are giving a lot of support in terms of knowledge um, about the other experience in the other countries also. And also, uh, I'd like to thank you, Olavo, <laughs> uh, for the opportunity to be part of this um, incredible um, team. Uh, and this government uh, is, is very special in, um, because we really want to make things happen. And I, we know we, we have some mistakes in the way, it's normal, but uh, um, the wish to be uh, to make the things right is bigger, so that's a um, um, great opportunity for me as a bureaucrat and also as a researcher, so I have to, to experience the both experience. I am um, a former student of uh, Fundação Getúlio Vargas, and I did my master's degree here, and Fernando Brusso was my advisor, still is, <laughs> uh, um, and also in the um, PhD. And so uh, that I took in University of Brasilia. So thank you. I would like to resist this. And so uh, much of our was uh, we're going to say is a red set for all the presentations, and especially Johanna, Eduardo, Olavo. So I'm going to directly to the state of the art of Council of Federation today, as far as, as we went since April when we it was created and we arrived at the federal government at, uh, sorry, I am a bureaucrat from the federal government for 20 years, but I arrived at secretary of, uh, special, uh, special secretary of federative affairs. That's the long name. But okay, can, can move the presentation please? Oh, yeah. uh, okay, which one, this? Yeah, okay, that's the decree that's, um, we have this decree, we only have some PowerPoints. We, we <laughs> use it to say that uh, we are 
still having our team um, complete. And I'll, I would also register that all of this is um, not only me and Andre. Uh, we have another people in the team. They are just arriving. So I would like to say thank you to Adriana and João Tedeschi and Paulo. They are bureaucrats and uh, also Fatima. And they are bureaucrats from the federal government and they just joined it to help us in this huge challenge. And they have contributed out for all of this that we are going to present here. So thank you guys there in the YouTube uh, watching us. <laughs> so um, the, I would like to highlight just this um, when Lula's, uh, in the Lula's speech, um, in the day that he signed the decree, uh, he he had a meeting uh, with the governors and the mayors to, to to speak about the violence at schools. At that time, it happened something very, very sad in Brazil in a school. Um, he said that um, I, I will read it. I don't have a definitive solution for the case, and I want to share your wisdom, a little bit uh, of each wisdom, allowing us to build the definitive so sit solution for this case. So it's about wisdom, it's about sharing. That's the perspective of the creation of this um, council, this committee. Um, actually, um, the context, uh, as we came from the Bolsonaro's government, we had uh, no dialogue, um, not social, neither um, federative. So just to point some uh, examples that uh, a lot of councils were extinguished. So um, it's um, uh, including CAF, CAA, the Committee of Articulation Feder I'm sorry, I forgot the word. <laughs> and the Committee of Fer Federative Articulation. And, and also, uh, this uh, was um, a period of um, the lack of co federal coordination also. So uh, we came from this um, context and also um, a period of uh, dismantling or policy drifting. So I, I, I was working at IPEA just before going to um, the um, uh, Federative Affairs and there we, we had two studies I would like to highlight here regarding this period and um, one it's it's this book uh, um, that shows the dismantling process of a lot of po national policies like uh, social policy environment infrastructure infrastructure and science technology governance so it's in the, the website of ipea and now so um, we had this very new publication about the role of the states so we, uh, me and Andre, we had this um, group of researchers um, thinking about uh, uh, the, the role of state uh, level of government. So different perspectives, more than uh, 60 researchers thinking about this in the different st institutions from all the, the, the country, some of them are the, here. <laughs> including Catarina, Abruzzo. Um, I'll see it. There are good publications to know better about our recent story and in terms of federative. Uh, um, and also I'd like to hi highlight the role of the judiciary. A lot of uh, presentations here talk about this, but it's uh, very important to make this moment uh, the right moment to have a council of federation. That's the what I, what I should um, emphasize here. So in January 8, um, we had um, that um, event on um, breaking the things of, of the buildings, the buildings, buildings, invasions and public uh, buildings. And uh, after that, uh, they had a meeting of the president with the governors in Brasilia. We in wrote a letter, it's Brasilia letter, where it where shows the, the importance of dialogue, a federative dialogue, 
And that was the very first time they talked about a council of federation. So it, it started this time with the governors. Um, uh, so the president uh, signed the letter and now to the, gov the governors. In, and they emphasized the model of consors consortia of uh, states um, logic of um, working together. Um, and that's the a principle of our, our structure now in the Council of Federation. So um, this, um, so uh, we, we had this huge challenge to write the decree in a few weeks. So we started to talk with everybody we could. So that's when Rupak came to Brazil and shared with us all his knowledge and his, his experience and also Vicente Travers and also, Olavo uh, was our leader. <laughs> As I said, political leadership is essential for this kind of council. So he had uh, this since the principle. And, and that's, uh, we look at for the models of Canada and in Australia mainly. And that's uh, important to, to say a uh, few things. Um, this council is a council of um, advisory for the president. It's not binding. Is it clear? No. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. It's not binding. It produces political commitment, and this is important because we we need to uh, be clear with our partners, uh, with the states and municipal. Bureaucrats and both the leaders. Yeah? Um, uh, its object is um, to build strategies and identify common priority, priority interests. So this meeting of the agendas, this, this is what we are uh, our actual challenge. And for what? Uh, so we have this uh, uh, objective to get sustainable social and economic development and reduction of social and regional inequalities. That's what we put in the decree. And then we really, 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 really looking forward to get this together with the other great council in the civil society perspective and we are in the federative dialogue perspective. So we don't have the answer for the greatest federative challenge, but we have this strategy. Actually, we are building this strategy. So that's important to hear how uh, you can uh, teach us about the, uh, your researches and our experience because we need uh, to be effective. We don't have a lot of time and we have to um, take um, the, this is an opportunity to make the difference, so we, we don't want to lose it. Uh, that's why we are really studying, reading, and talking with everybody we can. And um, so uh, the our way of operate is first dialogue, always dialogue, listing uh, the states and municipal, and also the ministers. And the we have um, I am part of a bureaucrat career. Uh, that uh, works in the every minister. So I talk with my colleagues and also Andre and li listen what they are uh, having in their agenda in, and trying to put them that together with the agenda that we are here. We are listening from the states and municipal in order to prepare a document to give our uh, secretary and then make the council happen. Uh, it, uh, it is still don't, didn't have, we didn't have the first meeting yet, but it will uh, happen soon, we hope. Um, so um, actually, I'm um, going to the composition, just to say that we have the perspective to be um, equality. So six uh, representatives from each level of government. So in the federal level, we have um, the president, the vice president, the minister of institutional relations, um, the uh, civil office minister, and two more ministers defined according to the issue that will be 
um, discuss it in the meeting. So that's uh, how we conceived it. And for the states, as I said, it's consortium model of representation. It's important to say that we had we have 26 governments governments um, is, um, in the state level and one federal district. So it's a lot of people to sit in the same table. Uh, more than 5,000 municipalities. So we have to this have this indirect representation, with which uh, uh, makes more complex um, the discussion, the legitimacy of their decisions. But that's the way because even 18 is not uh, a small amount of people. <laughs> so we we try to balance it, and for the uh, so we have. Um, Governors from this five regions from the country, uh, they come, the consortia indicate which region uh, indicate the representants, representative, and also one of the forum of governors, which is a national meeting from the governors. It's informal, but they also have one uh, representation in terms of national. And also for the municipalities, we have three main uh, in municipal entities, uh, which represent different, uh, they have different kinds of representation. So as Catarina and uh, Eduardo said, and our minister, uh, we have a, a national, uh, Frente Nacional de Prefeitos, I forgot how to translate. National Front of Mayors, yes, because I can't. <laughs> It's too far. Um, it, uh, it represents the big cities, the biggest. The, um, and also the confederation of mass, national confederation of municipalities that is represents the medium and small municipalities, and they have a Brazilian association of Brazilian municipal association. That is the first one, very first one. I think it is like forty. Yes, forty. Ninety-four to six. So it was very first a representation of the municipalities. It's a small one, but it's very important. Another. So uh, we have this um, this composition now, and we have been uh, talking to them uh, individually. So each one we have uh, we have had moments with all of them, and now we are going to start to have a meeting with everybody together. So. It's a uh, that's our it's in red. It's our first role and challenges to agree on a common priority agenda. And I should say that it's much more difficult than it sounds because uh, most of these actors and the entities they are used to be represented to talk with the federal government. But if you ask them. Or for the municipali municipalities, what do we want from the state level? And they, yeah, I, I, I kind of, uh, I should say, I don't know of Andre's opinion, but I, I should say they are, um, they haven't to haven't stopped to think about this in that way. So our proposal is to think the federation. So. Uh, um, f make this in, uh, encounter uh, this meeting of agendas thinking about the federation what what's uh, what your agenda individual agenda says about the agenda of the federation and what should be uh, the agenda of the federation that's the very moment we are living so we did this a uh, task and we um, we, inf we identified um, huge uh, themes and very small ones. So that shows uh, that the complexity of getting all these people together. <laughs> no. And uh, the other things, I think it's a part of this. We, um, the role is contribute to formulation of public policy, propose projects, actions, for uh, strengthen uh, cooperation and federative um, coordination, encourage promotion of uh, it in subnational level. We, we really want to reinforce the role of coordination of the state level of government. It's very important. Katarina is an, a specialist on this. The, it makes difference when the um, state level coordinate the municipalities. And also policy diffusion and 
um, make study, propose the studies, um, conduct the studies. So just uh, to getting to the point here to have a discussion, just a few rules of uh, how it is going to work. So the plenary is the place where the decision happens. So um, it's a twice meeting. Um, the meeting is happens twice a year regularly. Can be extra. Can have uh, extra extraordinary come, but mm, is not the, the the point now. Uh, we are trying to follow this. Uh, slowly because we are just getting the credit of our partners. Uh, this, they have to believe in the in the in the council as we believe. So that's our this our very moment. And um, the quorum is the majority of each level of government and the liberation by consensus and by uh, resolutions. Uh, it's the way that we will. Um, make the decisions appear to the to the um, public policy world, and, and also the members of Congress, judiciary, and experts are can participate as guests, depend on the issues. So um, we have a plenary, we have a general secretary, which is um, the function of a minister of institutional relations. So he sits in the table with the minister with the President and governors and mayors and conduct their, the meeting. We have a executive secretary in the in, in who is in charge of that is the special secretary of federative affairs, Andrea Siciliano, the very important person who make the political arrangements for things happens, <laughs> and uh, he's very good at that. And uh, we have the technical secretary that are the bureaucrats. So our team uh, uh, will work on these um, tasks. And uh, we will have, less, uh, like Johanna said, um, working groups. We are calling them technical chambers in some of permanent and now some temporary, depends on the issues we, we will um, we'll deal with. So I'm not going in the detail of this, but it's uh, a, a way to draw our uh, what we are proposing to our partners. We have to discuss this with the collective. So the technical secretary, it's important to say, is not just us. Uh, it's uh, we invite uh, a per uh, um, executive secretary of the, each uh, entity. You know, of the consortia and the municipal entities to prepare the meetings. Not so the meetings are not prepared just for the fed by the federal government, but also for a, rep a representative, a bureaucrat, representative of each of the members of the plenary. Is it clear? Yes. So we have another 18 people in the technical secretary. And uh, we are going to meet as a um, collective, and I hope in next month. And just, just uh, I, here I can summarize what we are working now, um, the action axis. So first of all, we, we want to create identity for this technical secretary. As I said, um, the, these people were used to, to, to talk with the gover federal government. So we need to meet each other in order to have an um, identity as a new institution. And a new institution that needs to dialogue and to see different perspective. So we need to, uh, to qualify and to teach each other their each point of view. Uh, it's, it's not easy, but uh, we think it's possible. We are having a good uh, reception of these people. Um, also, we uh, will have next month a uh, seminar in order to discuss the challenge of uh, Brazilian Federation in this very moment with our de within our democracy and fiscal um, restrictions and so everything, we, we, as we said before, you are all invited. It's going to happen on 17th August. Uh, we hope you can um, 
uh, stream in YouTube. We are working on this. So uh, we, we invited the greatest specialists to discuss and think about our challenge as a Council of Federation. And also, uh, we are discussing the agenda of common interest, and we are really uh, dedicated to study all the documents of the states and level, state, state and municipal um, entities and consortia to what they are producing, and in order to uh, start the discussion in the collective uh, perspective of which is the agenda of Brazilian Federation. That's the point, and that's the very beginning of the Council of Federation, defining the agenda of our federation. So that's it. Um, thank you for your, for your attention. <laughs> and if you have any questions, I'm here to, I will be happy to answer. Thank you all. Thank you very much, Eleni. So I think that we can have a few questions. And so, please, if you have. Mm -hmm. Of course. I will, I will make two comments that I think it could help the questions and also Eleni can, I think, speak a little more. Uh, about the, identi the, the identity of uh, the bureaucrats, I think it's important to, to think that in Brazil we don't necessarily have uh, intergovernmental bureaucrats in the state and municipal levels as we find in other uh, federal countries. So I think this is something important and maybe Eleni can, can talk a little more about that. And also uh, this, this dynamic of that Eleni just presented of how it will work uh, actually, I, I think, but then you can you can you can say if it's inspired in other uh, in, uh, intergovernmental arenas that already exist in Brazil. So I think you can talk mm -hmm. a little more about that. Anything else? Please. Who? I don't know. Ah, you have the microphone, so please <laughs> you have the press and the seat. <laughs> Lamento, <laughs> eu um, não posso falar português, mas um, queria dizer uh, muito obrigado. Um, ok, desculpa, I have to. <laughs> <laughs> you must change. <laughs> um, in a very short time, Mr. Secretary, I think you summarized what we try to find out in two days. Federalism is a process. Democracy is a process. We can learn, but we must take context into consideration. And I think there's much in the Brazilian case that I have learned to build upon. And it's great the, that you want to learn from us, but I find this very inspiring. So, so now one technical question, then I'll stop. <laughs> Um, do you consider having also legislative actors specifically involved? From how I understand the sketch now, it's more executive governors, mayors. That makes a lot of sense. Also, it's a consultative, as I understand, consultative body. But moving forward, could it be helpful to include also the legislative mm. arenas at each level. Thank you. Você falou que eu posso ver também dos prefeitos e governadores que podem incluir também representantes do parlamento municipal e estadual nesse conselho. Pode. É, se vocês pensaram nisso. Não. Nós, é, na legislação brasileira, é, o Senado nasce não como uma Câmara, Câmara Revisora, mas como uma casa da federação, é, que é uma discussão né, antiga aqui do, no, dos nossos especialistas aí. E quando nós lá atrás discutimos a criação do CAF, a gente já considerava que era um espaço de negociação intragovernos, que não substitui o papel 
uh, do Legislativo, que não substitui o papel do Senado. Co nós teremos é, pontos de conexão e diálogo, mas uh, a avaliação é que trazer para dentro desse espaço é, o Legislativo, nós estaríamos é, rompendo algo maior da nossa Constituição e poderíamos é, inviabilizar a razão daquele espaço, que era de negociação <coughs> intragovernamental. Como a dinâmica do Legislativo ela é muito potente, essa dinâmica ela não nós vimos como algo que era melhor deixar que as duas dinâmicas uh, se conversassem, mas não que uma viesse é, é, integrar a outra. Né? Pode ser que a avaliação futura venha sugerir algo mais integrativo, né? algo mais integrativo. Hoje, a avaliação é de que a gente precisa botar esse espaço em pé, construir pontes que vão fortalecer o diálogo, o diálogo no legislativo e que aquilo que acontece no legislativo pode pautar aqui também, mas, uh, inclusive, como um conselho consultivo e né, intragovernamental, uh, nós preferimos, nesse, pelo menos nesse primeiro passo, esse modelo que eu chamaria de mais, mais modesto. Well, he said that it would overlap with the Senate, since the Senate is, was thought as to be the House of House of Federation, the House of States. If you include members of the legislatures, both of the municipal and state level, in this council, it would create a conflict with the Senate, and so it's better to avoid that. It's better of course, to uh, incorporate some of the subsidies, some, some of the ideas that come from the legislature, but not with a formal inclusion, since the Council of Federation was thought to be uh, uh, an instrument of intergovernmental relations, considering governmental the executive branch only, and not the legislature. Hidden skills. Huh? Hidden skills. Hidden skills. <laughs> <laughs> Now we have a second. <laughs> yeah, muito, muito obrigado. Um, my question goes into a similar direction. I mean, firstly, I would say Brazil is always good for democratic innovations, and I really see this as, as well as one because it gives the local government sphere a much stronger, especially the local government sphere, a much stronger uh, weight and much more influence, and that they will really appreciate it, I'm sure, the local government association. The question is, For me, I mean, it's difficult when the president is participating. Who is chairing the whole thing? Is it the, the what are the, is, is this one of these three groups? Or is it the local government group? Or is it the federal group or the state group? And secondly, why not, um, I mean, it goes a little bit into the direction. There shouldn't be an overlapping with the parliaments. Uh, but uh, why not having uh, ideas coming from the population, let's say online, be using DESIDIM or uh, things, uh, instruments like that for the agenda setting. Because who's doing the agenda setting? That is, of course, always crucial. I forma de participação que surgem a partir dos municípios. Isso não seria o caso de pensar em forma de participação popular dentro do Conselho da Federação? Não dá para ter os legisladores, mas poderia ter a população. Muito interessante. Então, eu ia falar do Conselhão. É, com a mesma lógica, é, no, no escopo dos trabalhos da SRI, nós temos esse outro Conselho que é com as várias representações da sociedade, que também é algo novo. Veja, quando você é, se depara com o Conselho Nacional de Educação, você tem ali praticamente membros da mesma tribo discutindo. 
Quando você tem o um Conselho Nacional dos Direitos da Mulher, você tem ali membros da mesma tribo discutindo. Você vai para o Conselho Nacional de Meio Ambiente, você tem membros do, da mesma tribo discutindo, amadurecendo, pactuando. O é, Conselhão ele é um lugar em que os diferentes estão na mesma mesa discutindo o país, grandes agendas nacionais. E esse conselhão, esse Conselho de Desenvolvimento Econômico, Social e Sustentável, que agora ganhou um S, né? é, num momento muito oportuno, é, esse conselhão vai de, ele também terá um ponto de, de diálogo e conexão com esse Conselho da Federação Intragovernamental. Nós podemos, é, no futuro, é, chegar à conclusão de que eles precisam se precisarão se entrelaçar mais. Mas aí eu estou fazendo um exercício é, de empirismo e de futurologia, no, no nosso caso, como representante de governo. É, Para quem pensa, para quem é, formula... É, e para quem estuda isso, talvez o modelo que nós estamos apresentando é, seja insuficiente, poderia ser melhor. É, eu me atrevo a, a dizer é, que, como nós estamos falando de um país tão grande, tão diverso, tão continental e tão assimétrico, é, e que a experiência de coordenação federativa a experiência de é, é, cooperação federativa, ainda é, nós temos muito o que aprender nessa experiência, a gente quis proteger esse processo do Conselho da Federação, inclusive por uma questão que eu falei aqui, que é, é, é considerar os frágeis. Porque, numa mesa em que você é, traz o ambiente do parlamento, você traz o ambiente da sociedade, a tendência é que, naquilo que era o centro dessa mesa, que são os entes federados, os mais fortes teriam mais vez e mais voz. E essa mesa ela precisa dar a oportunidade para os frágeis terem é, acento efetivo, terem potência. Né? Então, essa escolha ela foi uma escolha mais modesta nesse sentido. É, mas nada impede que, no futuro, se o amadurecer, o amadurecer da, do, dessa caminhada levar para algo desse tipo, essa reflexão é muito válida e fica... Fica aí um bom registro aí, né? Para um, que pensemos para que lados vamos crescer e amadurecer. Well, first of all, I received an order from my boss, Eduardo Green, that we have to finish just after this answer. And so if anyone else has some kind of question, please send it written. This, this part of the section, sorry for that. Well, just to translate this very quickly. Um, Uh, we have many councils in the in the government that promote participation, but with the specific gangs of different groups, like the Council uh, National Council of Education or the National Council for the Right of Women. Uh, all this case, you have the same group there, and the idea of the large council, big council. I don't know exactly how to translate that. The National Council of Economic and Social and Sustainable Development, this last S was added right now, uh, is to promote the gathering of different groups and not only the ones that only relate to themselves in an ordinary way in the specific councils for specific policies. Uh, besides that, this general council will establish a relation with the Council of the Federation too. It's important to intermingle the both councils in the near future, but they don't know exactly now how it will occur, but they know that it's important to do that. Uh, perhaps the model is insufficient, we don't know, but well, we have to learn 
a lot uh, in a such uh, diverse, big, uh, asymmetric country, continental country like Brazil, and so it's necessary to improve as we go on. And finally, uh, it's important also uh, not only to learn how to coordinate all this kind of interest, but to consider specifically and with priority the more fragile sectors of society with delicacy. It's important to consider them. And so I think that's all. Thanks. <laughs> E agradecer o novo tradutor aqui, Cláudio Couto, também. Né? Obrigado. Obrigado. Foi, é? Ah, eu fiquei com o Caipirinha. Na dúvida. Eu queria que tenha um amigo, muito amigo, não, muito amigo do Vitor, que é muito elogiado. Que é da Nath. Ele fala, ah, o, 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 o Goiano é o mineiro extremista, mas também é isso. Mais distante. <risos> oh, muito bom. O mundo do Rogério é assim. <risos> Mas você é de onde? Você é de qual cidade? De Goiânia. De Goiânia mesmo. Eu não sei se você está falando de Goiânia. Mas às vezes é de Goiânia. O Goiânia é o primo pobre das Minas Gerais. Ah. É, o Mineiro foi mais longe. <risos> So just to uh, please, just to remind everyone, we have the last session of the conference. Please stay there. We have one more conference. Uh, please, Antonius and Professor Claudio Cote as well. Yes, 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 yes. I, I understand you. I do my seven thirty. Eduardo, I will do my presentation in German, and you will translate it in English. Or can we? Shall we, shall we do it like this to add a little bit complication here? <laughs> no, I will do it in English. Yeah. So I prepared a very long presentation, so I hope we make it until 780. <laughs> I thought about presenting each second chamber in the world now. <laughs> Country profile. Yeah. The uh, historical historical background. I was just saying that I will I will I just said that Probably I will do the presentation in Professor Rogério Schlegel. Are you German? Sorry. Schlegel. German. 
Tá aqui o Santos. Se você tivesse aparecido aqui ontem, você aqui ia traduzir. Pô, ainda bem que eu não apareci. <risos> Outro não podia, eu fiquei vendo por YouTube. Não 100%, eu confesso, mas eu vi porque é muito cansativo ficar o dia inteiro no YouTube. Você não aguenta. Ok. So. Um, Let's restart. So, now we. We. <coughs> We change here the positions and I will. Você viu que nem com o microfone. Não, pode deixar aqui. Uh, Eduardo. Uh, a culpa é do Abruzzo. O professor, it's... professor Fernando Abruzzo, o senhor está atrapalhando a retomada das coisas, professor. <risos> professor Fernando Abruzzo, professor Fernando Abruzzo, por favor, silêncio. <risos> <laughs> so now we we will start the the last uh, debate. Um, so I, we will debate the the role of the upper houses in federations, a comparison approach, and we will uh, have um, Antonio Suris uh, from the Free University of Berlin, and also Claudio Couto from. Fundação uh, Getúlio Vargas Foundation. I thank you both for being here and for waiting. And and and, and well, I, I apologize the delay. And now uh, I will give the the the, uh, the floor is yours, Antonio. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, so um, now the panel you all waited for the whole day. Um, <laughs> Thank you very much for the invitation and to present to you today the role of upper houses and federations. And thank you, Johanna, Eduardo, Rogerio, for the organization of the seminar. And I think um, now, honestly, I think the, this um, panel will be quite interesting because upper houses or second chambers um, mirror several questions we have discussed in the last days. And second chambers must deal with and make sense of this delicate relationship between federalism and democracy and the different political logics associated with the two. Um, they should give voice uh, to the constituent unions and enhance federal legislations while also mediating between the constituent, constituent units and between the two levels of government. And I was when I was thinking about it, I mean, this is a pretty demanding job description in a way, so let's see if and how upper houses can live up to it. Um, So as I understand that our panel is the last one before dinner, um, I will focus on these four points. I will start my presentation with some general ideas on bicameralism and federalism. And afterwards, I will focus on three elements. Um, it was a little bit tough to pick, actually, because it's a very vast topic. But uh, these three elements are usually analyzed by scholars interested in the comparative institutional design of second chambers and upper houses. Um, these are the selection of the members, the distribution of regional uh, representation in the composition of the upper houses, and the powers of the upper houses towards the lower houses. And in the third part, I present some thoughts on the complicated relationship between upper houses and democracy. And I will close my presentation with open questions for discussions rather than a conclusion, uh, because I'm also very much looking forward as my colleagues to Uh, the discussion and your thoughts and perspectives then from the Brazilian side. Um, so, even though it's rather an overview presentation, I would like to uh, advance two arguments in my presentation. So the first one is that in comparison, the main features of upper houses reveal that there is no single model, but a large variety of upper houses and federal systems around the world. And second, I will argue that upper houses are, in principle, no barrier to democracy, um, but a vital and essential part of it, at least if the political actors comply with the terms and rules of the political game. So, like most stories of federalism, the story of bicameralism and upper houses began with the Federalist Papers. Um, especially James Madison expressed his views on bicameralism in several of his writings. Um, and here we find basically three central points. So regarding checks and balances, Madison argued that the large republic with a diverse population would help prevent the tyranny of the majority. Bicameralism was seen as a crucial component of this system. Because Madison believes that a bicameral legislature provides an effective system of checks and balances. Um, having two separate chambers would serve as a safeguard against the potential tyranny of the majority, preventing hasty 
ill-considered or even oppressive legislation. And second, Madison saw bicameralism as a means to balance the interests of the states and the people. The House of Representatives, elected, di elected directly by the people, would ensure popular representation, and the Senate, on the other hand, would represent the interests of the states, and at the same time, and this is also a very important thing, protect the rights of the smaller states against potential domination by larger ones. And third, Madison believed that a bicameral legislature would enhance lawmaking. The two chambers would bring different perspectives and experiences to the table, allowing for more thoughtful and comprehensive discussion. And the Senate was seen as a chamber of greater stability and experience, providing a check on the passions and strategic interests that could dominate the lower chamber. So the Senate was envisioned as being capable of carefully reviewing and amending legislations. Wiser man sitting in the Senate. So this very last point became somewhat of a myth regarding upper houses and uh, second chambers. And it was not only established by Madison, but also Jefferson on underlined the importance of upper houses as chambers to reflect on policy and to temper the heat of politics. Um, allegedly, this is a story, I mean, I wasn't there, so, but in his conversation with George Washington, Jefferson compared the role of upper houses in politics with hot tea. A hot tea only becomes drinkable if poured from the cup into the saucer and back. So especially in the German research tradition, I can tell you um, the, uh, this is exactly the dominant view on the upper houses, especially on the German Bundesrat, um, which counteract the short-sightedness of politics with long-term thinking, and it helps realizing societal consensus as well, of quality, as well as qualitatively superior legislation. So, I mean, this is a topic I'm very interested in hearing from your perspective, whether you can agree on this. We had several discussions already at IPSA about that. Um, but this is the general idea. So the three elements of upper houses, the selection of their members, the distribution of regional representation and their composition and their powers towards the lower houses are usually analyzed by scholars interested in comparative institutional design of upper houses. And there is no single upper house model. However, we might say that there is a US model in a way, which was also in principle followed by the Latin American federations. And in very short, senators are directly elected, states are in terms of the number of senators equally represented, and the senates have far reaching veto powers. And now for presentational reasons, it would be great to say that there is a second group, a parliamentary group or something like that, but there is no one single counterpart to this US Senate model. Of course, this has also because each country has its own history and historical legacy. So let's take my country, for example, Germany. In Germany in 1949, a Senate was considered um, by the founding fathers and two mothers of the constitution. However, in the end, the Bundesrat was created in 1949. And this was also owed to a much earlier model of the institutions in the 19th century. Um, I'm very happy that Rupa yesterday already indicated that Germany was a federation before 1919. Um, so what you can see here is the first federal state on German territory, the North German Federation established in 1866. And its constitution was adopted one year later and it established a Bundesrat, which uh, consisted of representatives of the state governments. Um, to adopt a law, a majority both in the federal parliament, the Reichstag back then, and in the Bundesrat was necessary, and this gave the state governments far-reaching veto powers. And basically, this is exactly the institutional design we have today although it's a bit different now uh, regarding the specific procedures, but the basic idea remained the same. So altogether, we can say the others are a very diverse group leading to the overall large variety of upper houses, second chambers in the world. So let me turn first to the methods of selection for members of federal second chambers. And I think it was it is a very daunting task sometimes to come up with categories, but I think we can say that we have broadly four groups here. So some upper houses, also like Brazil and especially the US, we all know, are directly elected. 
But then we have indirectly elected upper houses as they are elected by the state legislatures. And this is, for example, in Austria the case. So the state legislators vote uh, for the upper houses. The third method is appointment. This includes, for example, Canada, where senators are appointed by the federal government, and Germany, on the other hand, where the Bundesrat is made up of delegates of the state's governments. And this is also, to recall Johanna's presentation, the Bundesrat is both a parliament and an arena for intergovernmental relations because it's basically executives who sit there. And finally, we deal with mixed memberships. Um, a particularly interesting case is South Africa, I guess, where the South African National Council of Provinces combines the two arrangements of Austria and Germany. So the National Council has 90 seats, consisting of 54 representing provincial legislatures and 36 representing provincial executives. So you can already see on selection that there's a, a very much a diversity around the world. Turning to the distribution of regional representation and the composition of federal upper houses, it is often assumed that equality of state representation in the federal upper houses is the norm in federations because it's the US model. I understand that you also have it here in Brazil, also have it in Argentina. But for example, like here, three senators per state or in the US, two senators per state. So this is the norm. But this is from the European, continental European perspective not the norm at all because uh, we have an effort to weight representation and fall off in, in, in favor of the smaller regional units. So in Germany, for example, the constitution defines four groups of lender in terms of their population, which then have three, four, five or six votes in the Bundesrat. So the smallest land, Bremen, has three votes and the largest one, North Rhine-Westphalia, has six votes. So weighted regional representation may also help protecting minority rights. This is, for example, the case in Belgium, very prominently, because the regional representation in the Senate in Belgium is designed to ensure a balance between the linguistic communities and regions of Belgium. So there's a differential representation of each community and region specified in the constitution. And for some very significant issues, um, the constitution requires majorities within both the French-speaking and the Dutch-speaking members in the Senate. And in India, also a very interesting case, the federal government appoints 12 members to the upper house to protect very special minority rights. So you can also see here a large diversity. Um, then we come to the powers. I mean, this is, is of course, almost impossible to um, present in one slide. Um, so I somewhat simplified it um, and only look at the powers of upper houses towards the lower houses using a single dimension, which is, of course, the reality is much, much more complex. But the poles of this dimension are suspensive veto and absolute veto powers. So. Veto power is naturally greater if the upper house has an absolute veto. So we find um, also, again, examples for both sides of the dimension, for example, Austria or Malaysia on the one side of suspensive veto. Um, in the case of the absolute veto, we have the United States, the Latin American Federation, and also Australia. And then again, um, we have this in-between group. So what we can say is that it's not only that you have different groups, but also different mechanisms and different procedures, how you would also resolve vetoes or blockades, as we say in Germany, gridlock, as, we, as Alan told me that they say in Australia. Um, for example, in Australia, gridlock is resolved by double dissolution of both chambers and then joint sitting of the two chambers which is, seems quite tough. Um, and also Alan told me that this only hap has happened a couple of times because it's a very formal mechanism, but only the threat, of course, of having dissolved both chambers makes something, right, to people. In the US, it's different because the US heavily relies on these mediation committees, which, yeah, I don't know, work. Some work sometimes, so they don't work. And then we have Germany and South Africa, 
in Germany, and this could be an introduction to German politics class, um, again, how we determine the legislation, which is subject of a suspensive veto and which is subject of an, um, of an absolute veto, because it depends on the specific legislation in Germany and it's determined case by case. So, and um, when you're wondering why Germany and South Africa are often in the same group here, um, the reason is simply that the Bundesrat advised South Africa in its reform process in the 1990s. So, I mean, maybe Norbert Kerstin can say something about that later on and give insights about that, because he uh, was there during that time. Um, but this is why the Bundesrat in South Africa, uh, South African um, Council is, uh, is often in the same group. So you, we can also see this cross-border learning. So this is just to give you a quick um, overview of the huge variety of upper houses and how they function. Um, but, and this is my next point, and I think we heard it a couple of times in the last days, they are upper houses, second chambers are often and regularly criticized. And it goes a little bit hand in hand with critics of federalism, um, who largely, um, and largely those critics who emphasize that the majoritarian essence of this democracy is the rule by the demos. Um, and I mean, as I already said, um, most federation have established upper uh, houses which favor the smaller constituent units. So in this way, upper houses would violate the cardinal principle of democracy that is one person, one vote. We already discussed that yesterday during the session with Marta. Um, so in the German Bundesrat, a single vote in Bremen counts significantly more than one in North Rhine-Westphalia. In the US Senate, uh, this is a, okay, this is the extreme example now, but uh, a single vote in Wyoming counts 65 times more mm -hmm. than its equivalent in California. Um, and such contrasts are replicated in many other federal uh, upper houses. So it can be argued that while federal institutions may place some limits upon simple majoritarian democracy, democracy more broadly understood as liberal democracy may be expanded by federalism. And democracy and governmental responsiveness are enhanced by federalism as multiple levels of government maximize the opportunity for citizen preferences to be achieved. And I think, I mean, this is a very basic idea of federalism and, and, and it's, it's, it's heavily cited as one of the main advantages and it also was discussed already here. But I think that second chambers and upper houses play the crucial role in this regard as they contribute to incorporate these preferences into national decision making and policy making. So a very, very important task upper houses have to fulfill. Um, from a liberal democratic point of view, by emphasizing the value of checks and balances and diffuse authority to limit the potential ty tyranny of the majority, upper houses also contribute to the protection uh, of individuals and minorities against abuses. This is also, for example, reflected in this um, special composition, for example, in Belgium or in India, what I just saying. And moreover, as Leipard noted, um, the checks um, on dem democratically elected um, majorities imposed by federal upper houses have often pushed these federations in the direction of consensus democracy, which contributes to accommodation of um, the different groups in the federation, keep the federation somewhat together. So indeed, um, I mean, what we can say is that the acceptance in most federations of the need for a federal upper house um, points to the vitality and recognition in these federations, not just, um, not just to, to account for an undifferentiated demos in a way, but uh, of the distinct demoi, Alan was already talking about this in his presentation, uh, in the various constituent units. So this would be something I would uh, reply if uh, people were criticizing uh, upper houses. But, and there's a huge but, um, this sounds of course great in theory, but of course we do not get the full picture if we do not look at the politics in upper houses and here especially at the behavior of political parties as the main actors there. 
I mean, parties are the key players in federal democracies because um, they determine how the formal rules come to life. So we may say formal, re uh, formal rules represent the hardware, um, parties the software in a way, and as you know, sometimes the software tests the limits uh, and the functionality of the hardware. So in recent times, we experience how um, party conflict and polarization challenge the basic idea of territorial representation in upper houses. Um, I think the US Senate, um, I mean, I'm very interested on the Brazilian perspective also here because uh, what I learned that the Brazilian uh, Senate could be also a very good example here. Uh, but the US Senate, around the globe, I think, may serve as a very prominent example for this development. And what we can observe in the United States is probably far away from the idea of deliberation towards a superior legislative uh, outcome as it was envisioned by Madison or Jefferson. Mm -hmm. um, it rather appears that the US Senate fell victim to party politics and party competition, um, also reflecting the increased political and societal polarization, which we do not only experience in the United Sta it States, but there in particular. Um, however, we also find examples where this development did not happen, at least it hasn't happened yet so far. And one of these examples um, is the German Bundesrat, in which um, uh, I did my PhD uh, for four years. I was re researching the Bundesrat, so I'm very familiar with this um, example. But I did not only pick it here because uh, I'm from Germany and I don't want to present it here as the optimal model, but it is a kind of a um, very good example which contrasts this Senate uh, idea, especially when you think about the US. Um, it is a very complicated institution. Um, and to explain all aspects, I mean, it's, it's cool that it's complicated because then you can do a PhD on this institution and on one way, but on the other hand, um, to explain all aspects now of the legislative and policy procedures would go way beyond the scope of the presentation. So I was uh, thinking when I was invited to give this talk today about a general illustration which can travel across German borders and maybe universally be understood around the globe, not getting so much into this very, very German details now, which are very boring, especially at this late hour. So I came up with this. Uh, this is the result of my considerations. Uh, you can say the <coughs> result of four years of research on the Bundesrat is my, my I came up with a cheeseburger. Um, but um, the cheeseburger basically, um, pretty much reflects our findings because um, we did this large research project for years, uh, compiled a huge data set comprising over 51,000 decisions because we wanted to see whether party politics dominate and um, party competition. Um, and it was a little bit, in a way, to sell research, a little bit sad because in the end we didn't find it. So that's always the case, right? Um, so um, we wanted to find it, but we didn't find it. So what we can see here is basically the most important ingredient of the Bundesrat um, are territorial interests of the state representatives. And then we deal with administrative interests because um, these um, refer especially to technical concerns of the lender ministries and bureaucracies regarding policies because in Germany, most legislation is made at the national level while the lender must administer and implement the legislation. So the um, knowledge, the experience in policy making, on-site policy making is not at the federal level but at the sub-national level. So they just know better the situation on the ground. So the lender want, for example, to stop or revise a certain proposal of the federal government because they already know this is not going to work. Um, we have the situation currently with the energy uh, crisis, for example. Um, and then finally, we deal with partisanship and only a couple of decisions are really subject to party competition in the Bundesrat. So um, from all we know, from the data set, from following uh, almost a hundred of interviews, um, partisanship ranks in fact way below territorial and administrative interests when you 
talk to the executives there. So overall, we find no empirical evidence that the Bundesrat fell victim to party politics. So I guess a completely opposite case compared to the US model and also compared to the Brazilian model. So basically, um, because this was basically my research from my PhD, so after like two years I was uh, now in, I was very happy to, to revisit the topic again. And the, so, and I was, when I was thinking about what I wanted to present today, it struck me again that I end up with more open questions than final answers actually. So uh, I have a lot of questions, but I try to focus on three sets of questions, open questions, which I, which I found most important. So basically the first one is, are there better or worse models of upper house or second chambers? And, and what do we mean by better or worse? Because the Bundesrat works differently than senates. But is this the better institution then? Or um, I would be very careful with these con sort of conclusions. So this was, is always a little bit this question. What, is, what do we mean by better and worse? Um, so second, um, what is territorial interest? And what is a party interest? Um, this is a crucial distinction when it comes to upper houses as we tend to um, perceive territorial interest as more legitimate than party interest. For example, we would completely, it would be completely differently covered in the media when the Bundesrat blocks legislation out of a territorial interest. It's a completely legitimate uh, um, process. But when it were party politics, then everyone's like, ah, party politics. Mm -hmm. but, but how can we empirically, uh, um, also empirically, this would be a very interesting question. I mean, we had 50,000 decisions but when it comes to policy, not only the decisions and the alliances and decision making, how can we determine whether a policy is driven by territory interests or party interests? I think it's a very, very um, difficult question. Um, and finally, uh, because this was also the, the major topic of, of, of the last days, um, how can upper houses adapt to the new challenges in the era of emergency? Because when we think with Madison, they shouldn't in a way, because it's wise old men sitting there and they try to get the heat out of the politics. But can we do this, uh, especially when we're facing so many emergencies? Do we have the time that the old wise men sit together, deliberate about policy? Um, how shall we adapt or do we need this kind of institution and in the heat we are facing? Um, so. Uh, or do upper houses have to adapt to the new challenges uh, and these multiple and overlapping crises um, we see also reflecting the political and societal polarization we, we kind of observe around the world. I think at IPSA there was evidence from so many countries and so many facets of this topic. So what, what role have upper houses there? It's also, a, I think, a very controversial and open question here. So. I'm very looking forward to getting to know the Brazilian perspective. And yeah, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Antonio. It was very interesting. I think you, you brought theoretical discussion and also empirical contributions. And now the Brazilian perspective with Claudio Couto. Uh, the floor is yours. Can we put the, yeah, sure. Yes, sure. they are just the slides. And here is, yeah. <coughs> I think that since I can't see very well what you do from yeah. the I would yeah. say yes. Yeah. Oh, but the, the microphone. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Oh, no. No. All right. Well, good afternoon. Oh. Why? Because every, every city is trying to, to, to present your thoughts in different ways. So no, Johanna was also yeah. here. <laughs> and so, but but my problem has to do not with my leg, but with my eyes. I can't see what's written there, and I will forget what I have to say. Ah, ah okay. On the, uh. All right. <laughs> All right. So let's start. Well, good evening to everyone. Uh, oh, I, I'll try to present here the Brazilian perspective about upper houses, or about per, probably not exactly upper houses, but considering the characteristics of Brazilian case, much more with bicameralism in Brazil. That 
has uh, some specificities that must be considered. The first of all uh, has to do with the origins of bicameralism in Brazil. Right? I don't know if everyone here uh, know that, but Brazil, before becoming a federal republic, it was an unitary monarchy during the 19th century. And so we have to consider how the Senate and the House were created at that time. And they were not created to solve, since it was an unitary country, federative problems, but to deal with another kind of issues. Our uh, bicameralism is not exactly something that tried to create a system of checks and balances, but much more at that time, I mean, uh, to create a mixed government in the same terms that we have mixed governments elsewhere, uh, considering two different groups in the society, the nobles and the rest of the society, the, the, the plebeian part of the society. So some characteristics here are specifically important. So sorry, I can't see exactly there. The first one uh, is that the post of senator at that time was for life. And so once the senators was, were appointed by the emperor after being elected in an indirect manner uh, at the state, not the state, at the provincial level at that time, we have two different kinds of voters at that time. We have the parish voters that vote for provincial voters. And the provincial voters were, were the ones responsible for electing not only the senators, but also the deputies at that time. And so it was an indirect kind of uh, election. But besides that, whereas the deputies were not elected for life, but for some years, uh, the senators were for life. So they, uh, the Senate in Brazil at that time was a kind of uh, aristocratic chamber, aristocratic house. It has much more to do with this idea, this is why I said that, of a mixed government than exactly with checks and balances. Uh, and besides that, uh, there was not uh, 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 the idea that every province would be represented by the same number or uh, an equal number of senators considering their population. Actually, both the deputies and the senators were calculated in what regards their numbers in terms of uh, uh, a representation that would have to do with the size of the population of every province. We have a, of course, a smallest number of senators than of if deputies. The number of senators were uh, defined considering the number of deputies per province. And after that, you, can see, you, you have the both houses framed and uh, it has to do with the distribution of population throughout the country, throughout the, all the provinces that we, haven't, uh, we have there. And finally, uh, we suppose that people would be elderly people at that time, and 25 years perhaps was something considerable to be considered an older uh, and wise, perhaps, <laughs> person at that time. It depends on the expectancy of life of every time, and also the princes uh, of the Brazilian Empire were also members, na native members of the Senate. And so we have this kind of origins of our bicameralism. And so it's necessary to consider some uh, path dependence when we go to the Republic, when Brazil is transformed into a federation after the Republic in 1889, and uh, we have some continuity to the origin of this bicameral system in the legislature, but not exactly a, con a total continence. The first thing is that we, uh, we emulated the American model in terms of the design of the both houses, but not necessarily in terms of the functioning of both houses originally, at least in terms of the theory behind the, the, the creation of a bicameral system in federal and republican countries like Brazil or United States. That is, until now, as Antonio already mentioned, Brazil uh, had a Senate that worked much more as a partisan house than properly as a federal house. That is, uh, the, the Senate in Brazil is not the house of the states. It's the second house of the parties. This is what must to be considered uh, since the beginning of the bicameralism in Brazil during the Republic. Uh, and is also 
a revisionary house that has to reconsider what comes from the house uh, with uh, an additional point that is quite important that the executive branch in Brazil historically has uh, a very prominent role in terms of proposing legislation. And since the beginning of the Republic in the late 19th century, all the bills that come from the executive branch, they start to be considered in the House and not in the Senate. And the House, uh, or let me say in a different way to not make confusion, the chamber where the legislation starts to be analyzed is the chamber that has the last uh, word in terms of what, of what will be uh, transformed in, a, in law. Uh, and so, just to give you an example of that, it was this, like this. At that time, it still is like this. If we have a bill that is proposed by the executive branch, it goes to the House, the House amends it, then it goes to the Senate. The Senate amends it again. When, and so it has to go back to the House. If the House decides not to accept the amendments of the Senate, but to establish the bill as it has established before, this is what prevails. And so we have some advantage of the deputies towards the senators in what regard a large part of the legislation, that is the legislation proposed by the executive branch. Of course, it happens also with the legislation proposed by deputies as well as it happens also for senators in what regard the legislation that they propose. But since we have this predominance of the executive branch, even more now, after the end of the military dictatorship, when we, we, we had, and again, a path dependence, in which the executive branch became much more powerful than it used to be before the, 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 the dictatorship, we have this special importance of the House in the general legislative process in Brazil. Just a curiosity here, this is one of the oldest newspapers that we have in Brazil. We start with Sao Paulo, uh, that was established in the 70s of the 19th century. And there is a very curious thing. Uh, its original name was the province of Sao Paulo. When we, the republic was established, it was not so difficult. The federal step, it became the state of Sao Paulo. But it's exactly the same newspaper. Uh, and it's a quite important representative of the Paulista feeling. Fernando knows very well that, since he's a very important representative of Paulista feelings. Uh, and <laughs> this, this uh, switch of names has to do exactly with this continuance that I'm trying here to stress. That is, you change the names, but not necessarily you change so much uh, the meaning of things or what the things really are. Well, again, among the senates, uh, um, uh, uh, in the Senate, we have some specific capacities for the senators that have not to do necessarily with federal issues. Like, for example, to judge the president and certain high officials, like members of the Supreme Court, for crimes or responsibility. It was established in the inauguration of the Brazilian Republic and Federation in 1889, and it is still this way. But what, what it has to do with federative issues? Not necessarily something. It has much more to do with the idea that we have in the Senate more wise people, elderly politicians, not exactly uh, to use uh, a very common Latin American uh, language in, in terms of politics, not exactly the ordinary Indians, but the caciques, the bosses, the chiefs of the tribe. That is, the Senate has in it the big bosses of the political parties in different states that are also, for that reason, national bosses of the states. Whereas in the lower house, we have the ordinary politicians. And so here it's a curiosity. At the same time that the house is very powerful in terms of considering legislation as a whole, even more and I will stress this point, considering the, the legislation that is proposed by the executive branch, on the other hand, the big bosses of political parties are not in the House, but they are in the Senate. And so, assuming that, and assuming that we are dealing with a different kind of politicians, 
a somewhat aristocratic house yet, notwithstanding uh, we don't have an aristocratic system anymore during the Republic, we still give the Senate this very important role. Also approving nominations, appointments to the Supreme Court, or even approving uh, nominations to Court of Audit, and also ambassadors for foreign service. And so uh, it's a special duty for the Senate, but it's not exactly a federative duty. This is the point. And again, we cannot say that this is the house of the states. It's an upper house, but it's not necessarily the house of the states. Well, uh, and so and how can we measure that? You mentioned the difficulty sometimes to measure this. What we have in Brazil are many studies that uh, consider the alignment of roll call votes both for deputies and for senators. And what these studies show is that in both cases, both in the Senate and in the House, we have a very similar and partisan behavior. There is, in the Brazilian coalition presidential system, what we have is uh, the same kind of coalitions that are framed by the executive branch in order to govern, working in the, both in the Senate and in the House. And so we have somewhat a repetition of the pattern in both houses. It's not a total repetition because we, besides uh, of that, that we have a somewhat symmetric case of bicameralism, we don't have a congruent bicameralism. Since the way of electing deputies on the, for the House and senators for the Federal Senate, it has the name Federal Senate, but well, at the same time the deputies are called Federal Deputies, uh, they are elected in a different manner, in a proportional representative system for the deputies, in a majoritarian system for, uh, for the senators. In the case of representative, uh, uh, proportional representation system, it's an open list, and so you can vote for different candidates nominally. Uh, in the case of the Senate, it's only, of course, a nominal vote for the candidate, but it's a first-past-the-post system. And so it, it, it creates a different combination of partisan representation, both in the Senate and in the House. What affects the way of making policy and the way of making also politics in the relationship between the two branches of government. But, uh, and so you can have a different size for the coalitions in the Senate and in the House, what makes a difference. Sometimes it gives the Senate a very moderative uh, role but not necessarily uh, it makes it work in a way that couldn't be called a partisan way. So it's, it's like we have two different compositions of the House, somewhat like in the US. Uh, despite, besides the fact that whereas in, in the United States we have a bipartisan system, and so you can have two different combinations of the majority, both in the House and the Senate, in Brazil we have a very fragmented multi-party system what creates uh, a different kaleidoscope of parties, both in the House and in the Senate. This is the, the difference that we have here. Uh, it doesn't mean that uh, never the senators can work in a state-oriented manner. It can happen, but only when very specific issues that have to do with state interest are on state. Like, for example, I give a, a historical, very important example here. Uh, that was when we were, in 2012, discussing the distribution of oil royalties, considering the exploitation of, of, of oil in the Brazilian coast. And so some states like Rio de Janeiro, for example, or Espírito Santo, were states where uh, a, a considerable amount of their revenues came from oil royalties, because they have oil expo expo uh, exploitation in their coast. At that time, there was a redefinition of this sharing of the monies, considering that, well, uh, everything that comes from the, from the soil uh, begin belongs to the Union, and so we have to share it in, in a more equal way. And so states like Rio de Janeiro and Espírito Santo lost a lot of money. And when you consider not only how their senators voted, but also their deputies voted, they voted in a state-oriented manner. It would be a political suicide for a deputy from Rio de Janeiro, for example, to vote in favor of this new distribution. Uh, but again, 
Uh, it's the same behavior, both in the House and in the Senate. And besides that, another point must be stressed. Uh, if one hand we have an equal representation for states in the Brazilian Senate, we don't have an exact proportional representation for deputies in the House. And why that? Well, the Brazilian Constitution establishes, and in former constitutions, we had seven constitutions in Brazil since the empire, uh, we had the similar rule, not exactly the same numbers, but a similar rule. The Brazilian Constitution establishes that the minimum uh, number of deputies that a state must have in the House is eight, and the maximum is 70. And so what happens? It happens that some states that are underpopulated, like some states in the northern region, in the Amazon region, they are overrepresented. And at the same, same time, states that are larger, actually much more Sao Paulo than any other, uh, are underrepresented. Just to give you a, a rough number, perhaps to have some adjustment considering the last uh, numbers in terms of the census, but uh, Sao Paulo should have, if we would have a, a, a one seat and one vote system, 115 deputies, but we only have 70. The state of Roraima in the north, it should have one deputy, because it's impossible to have less than one. Uh, but they have eight. We have some other cases like that. And so it creates the, a difference of representation, not only in the Senate that creates an equal system, or somewhat like in Germany or some other federations where you have not exactly an equal representation per state, but a more balanced representation of units of the federation in the, in the so-called federative house. Here we have this... Uh, uh, the situation of overrepresentation of the smaller states in both houses. And so we repeat this system, the, the, the model again here. And so, again, what kind of bicameralism is this? It's not exactly a federative bicameralism. It's a system that tries to create some checks and balances between the both houses. It really works. It is quite important. It was quite important, for example, during Bolsonaro's administration where the Senate was a, a, a hindrance to very radical policies that were being proposed by the president and that passed in the House, but they were stopped in the Senate. And so it makes a difference, but not in a federative manner. And this is what I think it's quite important to uh, stress here. Well, that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Claudio. It was very interesting. I learned a lot. And it was easy because no one, uh, you respect the time, so it was easy to, to be here. Uh, now I open uh, to questions. Anyone? I don't know what you Don't be shy. Thank you very much for those. Um, not only two very interesting uh, presentations, I think you had a particular challenge after such a long day. Um, I'm glad we still did this, because that was really worthwhile. And it's an important important issue. Um, I was glad you also mentioned um, the path dependency. Uh, um, I, uh, just a real quick note, I think there's a commonality then between the German and Brazilian and US case. I would say the origins are all aristocratic. Mm -hmm. Um, I kind of have a, an, my interpretation with the U.S. Senate was, yeah, that Hamilton and Madison, the Federalist Papers, they say things about the reflexive chamber. I didn't know that with the T, that was an inch, that was a cool picture. <laughs> but I kind of think that they're also, what, what, do you know that word like a palimpsest? 
palimpsest, and they have sort of a palimpsest of medieval upper chambers and lower chambers. I think it was for them unimaginable that you could have a unicameral system. Well, they had one in the U.S. first constitution, the Articles of Confederation, and I think that they didn't that didn't last very long. So they they sort of adapted something that already existed. So it was a readaptation. I would I would say. I would take a similar thesis that you had with the Brazilian case and say the U.S. Senate was um, also sort of like a palimpsest of the old medieval aristocracy. So my question, um, yeah, but in any case, I, I really like the comparative perspective, but at the end of the day, also we kind of find ourselves asking, well, why do we need second chambers? I think I would agree uh, and not being German, but being in German for me for a long time, so it's not patriotic if I say I'm a big fan of the Bundesrat. I think it's it's a really good model, uh, and I think it's a much more effective intergovernmental arena than than the U.S. Senate or I'm guessing the Brazilian Senate. Nor Norbert left. I I was going to say Norbert. I thought, yeah, yeah. <laughs> what do you think? Because I, I <laughs> not to open up a big German discussion, but I, I wonder if the the older guys would have said that Antonio's, I mean, Antonio's, you've done the empirical study now, but being influenced by the federalism scholars of the 70s and 80s still, we would have said, well, the Bundesrat is hopelessly blocked by partisan partisan blockades, and that's that's changed quite a bit. So that's very interesting. And um, So what do you say at the end of the day? What, what is the role of the second chamber? I mean, is it superfluous for intergovernmental um, interest representation? Or does it still have its value, but it's elsewhere, if that makes sense? Okay. Thank you. Uh, uh, then I think it. Uh, no, uh, I would say it's not exactly a question. So, so we try to, to do some comparisons because uh, when when we have uh, this uh, the Bundesrat case, you are talking about one integrated federation when the the governance system is parliamentarian. When you consider United States or even Brazil, we are talking about, I would say, not exactly as a dual federation, but not so integrated such as um, in Germany, but our governance system is presidential. Mm -hmm. So it's different the way how these senators can function, so can work, considering this, I would say, uh, other characteristics of the whole political system. And I would say that, specifically in the case of Brazil, when we compare with the United States, I would say that we have one uh, prejudicial, uh, another additional characteristic. We have as a very fragmented multi-party system. Mm -hmm. And this, uh, this process also is influenced the way how uh, the Senate works. It's different from the United States, because in the United States we have one uh, presidential bipartisan system. In Brazil we have a presidential multi-party system. So, in this case, I would say that Brazilian case uh, increased the cost, political cost, uh, uh, for the president negotiate many agreements because they must negotiate in three rounds. The first rounds in the House, the second rounds in the Senator, and the third round uh, again in, uh, at the House, or on the country, or the way around. Uh, the yes, in the, in the fourth round, the Supreme Court. So. It's a very complicated. Brazil is not a concession of federation, but it works like this because there are a lot of, there are a lot of little points in this case. Not, 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 uh, not, I would say, absolutely little points or suspensive little points, but de facto little points that creates a lot of difficulty to, to, to pass the law, to pass the bills. So I would say this is my comment. It's not exactly a mm -hmm. question, just to, to add this information for our debate. Thank you, uh, Juan. And then we, we... I have, yeah, a very quick question uh, for Antonio. Uh, I, I, I'm very interested in this, dif the, the different way of partisan and territorial interest in the Senate. And I wonder if you find any relationship between that and the way in which uh, senators are elected, right? Because intuitively, I would say, I would, uh, I don't know, say that uh, in cases when senators are uh, directly elected by the population, parties should have 
uh, I don't know, uh, most important role, but uh, I, I would like to, to know about your, your comparative uh, uh, work on this. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I would quickly respond to this uh, question, uh, the last question. Um, I think in Germany, what I what I left out, uh, because this probably belongs a little bit rather to this detailed knowledge about Bundesrat procedures, is we have multi, not only multi-party system, but we have multi-party coalitions. Mm -hmm. And what is very, very interesting about the German case now is that except for one party, all parties form coalition with each other. So we always say that when you think about German politics now, you think about Haribo, you know, the golden bears, as we say in Germany, when you have a red and like this, the sweets, because it is so colorful that it looks like a, like a bag of sweets, basically, because you have all these parties co forming coalitions with each other. And in the Bundesrat, um, these coalitions have to have a common position. And when they don't have a common position, they would abstain from vote. They have to, because this is a part of the coalition agreements. So, and since we need an absolute majority, basically, in the Bundesrat, and they ask you, are you in favor of adopting this legislation, then all the lender governments, coalition governments, which couldn't find a common position, they would not raise their hand. So this is not passing, in a way. So this is a very, and then you have, for example, the case that the Christian Democrats, they govern with the Green Party in some states, but with the Liberal Party in other states, and with the Social Democratic Party in other states. And so this becomes very, very, very complicated in a way, and this also maybe as an answer to Jared, um, this construction comes with a certain caveat. And this is that the Bundesrat is not a very innovative institution in a way. They don't, they don't propose the big reforms because it's a very conservative, in a way conservative, not in political terms, but rather legislation terms. Mm -hmm. It is a conservative, um, very technical institution. This is a little bit the, the, the downfall of it. That it, 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 when we need a, new, a big reform in Germany, it needs to have a majority of basically all parties. So, and for example, they wanted to impose a speed limit on the autobahn, the famous autobahn, where you can run as fast as you want. As you can imagine, the Green Party doesn't like that so much. So they try to impose a limit of 130 kilometers per hour. It's a slight majority now in Germany in favor of a speed limit. But it's a very, very slight majority, and certain parties are against it because they represent the other side, and the Bundesrat voted against it. So this is always a little bit this caveat about the system. That, um, and this is also the older um, generation of uh, federalism scholars who would say, yeah, we, we, we can't um, do big reforms because of this institution, because you always have a party which says, no, we are against it, and then you don't find a certain majority, and especially also for amendments of the constitution, because they have to pass also with a quality um, with a with a large majority, with a qualified majority through the Bundesrat, and then you need even more lender on your side, and so this is basically this um, that is it's 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 rather preserving the status quo than going forward with something. Yeah, this is maybe the the, the downfall and the, the flip side of this model. Although it might, um, yeah, my, might even make better legislation in many ways, but reforms are a little bit more difficult. And I would say, um, um, and I would say, exactly, yeah. And and I would uh, answer why we need uh, upper houses. I mean, I think you made a great point because you had a very extreme situation, and in a way, the Senate functioned then against the Bolsonaro government in a way. So I mean, this is a very anecdotal evidence, um, mm -hmm. but we are talking about an era of emergency, so probably it's go not going to be the last pandemic, it's not going to be the last crisis. So I mean, in a way, the it, it sounds that... that it, the, happened, it happened before with other ones, not in such a, in such a tragic way, but... 
And so maybe this is a, a, at least the evidence, right? To mm -hmm. see that it's working as it should work at some place, yeah. Mm -hmm. And Claudio, and then. Uh, okay, uh, uh, just to, to be very quick, uh, just a point. Now it's working. Uh, well, it's very interesting this point about the presidential system. Uh, uh, and even because uh, it's interesting that we have seen some years ago some people trying to use the idea of divi divided government to analyze the situation in Brazil where one of the houses uh, could have a position against the president like this, or perhaps not so favorable against the president. But divided government makes sense in the US or in a bipartisan system. It doesn't make sense to talk about bipart uh, sorry, the divided government in a multi-party system. What kind of divide? <laughs> if we have two blocks, perhaps we could talk about this, but we don't have that. We have a kaleidoscope. We have a very fragmented situation. Uh, and of course, I at the same time, you don't have the issue that they will face now in Spain, for example, of creating a new government in a very fragmented city, or they used to have some time, or many other times in Israel, or in Belgium, and so on. Uh, well, you have the president. The president perhaps won't have a majority in one of the houses, or perhaps in both, but well, it, you still have a government. It doesn't matter why. And so I think that's something uh, that's quite important to, to stress. Uh, and finally, just uh, one point that uh, I should, it would be interesting to, to mention that has to do with the facto and the jury situations. Uh, at the same time that we have this situation of this proportion of representation, both houses of the Congress, we historically have, and this is the facto and not the jury situation, an over-representation in ministries and mostly in main ministries like finance in the Supreme Court of the more, how can I say, central states in Brazil. Like, for example, the state of Sao Paulo, since the beginning of the republic, has much more representatives in the Supreme Court than any other state. Uh, there is a very interesting article by Pedro Neiva in which he says exactly the following, that perhaps the most uh, representative unit of the federation at the Supreme Court, or most represented, actually, units of the federation at the Supreme Court, is the College of Law of the University of Sao Paulo. And so you have this kind of thing. At the same time, in the Minister of Finance, in the Central Bank. And so, well, this the, the jury disproportion, perhaps it counterbalances this de facto situation of power sharing among the, 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 the units of the, of the Federation. Sorry, just a, a, a couple of observations, and I'll be, I'll be short. Uh, given, given that federations are made up of constituent units, whether they're holding together or coming together, I think in principle, I think it's very important that there should be institutional representation of some kind for the states as equals. And so in that sense, I think an upper house is, is, is important. Uh, having said that, to, to me, you know, it seems that the only, the only Senate upper house that fulfills that function is the Bundesrat and copies of the Bundesrat, it's like, like in Ethiopia. The Ethiopia House of Federation is based uh, on the Bundesrat. The US Senate was like that, but it has changed uh, since the 1960s. Uh, and the second point I think that merits a closer look is the, the, the structure of the party system and the impact that has on not just on senates but also on parliaments. But in the context of senates, um, you know, there are three, there, there are possibly three kinds or three or four kinds of outcomes depending on the nature of the party system. If you have a highly centralized party system, then you're going to have a senate that is very highly partisan. Mm -hmm. If you have a weak party system, like in the United States, even though senators represent parties, really, if you look at it, senators in the U.S. represent themselves. Themselves, themselves. personally. As individuals, mm -hmm. and you know, some t and and they 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 will often do things that are uh, not in the interests of the party that they belong to, uh, but but you know they, they navigate it so that they can stay on. And you just look at the tenures of senators in the United States. You know, it's it's very individualistic. 
there is a, there is a, a, a third scenario where you could have uh, a Senate that's elected in a, on a partisan basis. Uh, but, but of course, it, and I'm using the example here of Canada, but it's not that way. In Canada, the federal parties and the provincial parties are distinct legal entities. And so just because you're, you belong to the Liberal Party doesn't mean that at the provincial level you're on the same side uh, as, the, as the Federal Party. Now, unfortunately, in Canada, we don't have a, an elected Senate. We have an appointed Senate. And so that doesn't play out. But, but that, that could be one way. So I, I think it's very, uh, you know, I think you've touched it on a very important, in, in your discussion of Germany, I think this is an area for further research, which is structured party systems and the impact that has. I mean, I India is a good example. Uh, again, centralized party systems. In India, it is the uh, state legislatures that elect uh, through an electoral college made up of the state legislatures uh, and university professors who, <laughs> who, who elect uh, members that go to the upper house. You know, this reflection, right? I mean, uh, you know, we know better than the people. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's it. But uh, but because it's a very highly centralized party system, they're not actually electing people on merit. Because if you have a majority in the parliament, uh, you can you can essentially get your slate through. So what happens in that kind of context is you you get uh, failed uh, failed politicians who cannot get elected uh, <laughs> to the lower house of parliament, but come through the back door. I mean, in India, we had for ten years a prime minister. The only one, this is uh, Manmohan Singh, the only prime minister uh, since independence who was not a member of the lower house because he could not get elected <laughs> to the lower house. And so they had to find a back door through the upper house to get him. <laughs> he, was, he was a member of Rajya Sabha. Unprecedented. He had three senior ministers who were members of the upper house. Unprecedented because they were unelectable. <laughs> Ah, yeah, yeah, just, just, uh, yeah. This is a uh, an interesting information. In Brazil, all the parties are national. We uh, since the since 1934, when uh, four years after Vargas seized the power, our patron. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 so very democratic. Actually, a dictator for 15 years, but well, we can manage. Uh, after, that. after that, no, after that, uh, in 1950, he was elected democratically, and after that, his suicide. Uh, it was too much to be elected democratically for him. Uh, but no, <laughs> but in Brazil, since 1934, when the electoral code, uh, a national electoral code, was framed by Vargas, we never had any more. Uh, state or provincial parties. And uh, there was a, a very important reason for this, is that uh, the, the, the kind of state building that Vargas established after 1930 uh, had to do with reducing the influence of local bosses and state bosses in national politics. Until then, I, I mentioned the, 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 the newspaper with Stato São Paulo, we used to have in the state of São Paulo, for example, the uh, uh, Partido Republicano Paulista, the Paulista Republican Party. In Minas Gerais, we have the Min Min Mineiro Republican Party, and so on. Now, in his state, Rio Grande do Sul, we have perhaps two parties, because Rio Grande do Sul is a special case. But, uh, <laughs> but at the same time, we have also, also this state parties and and so it was a and now it's in on the constitution that the par parties must be national it created some years ago some confusion in the in the electoral supreme uh, superior electoral court and after that in supreme court in terms of the interpretation that the justice gave to this idea uh, of uh, national parties and you mentioned the different coalitions at state level uh, they established that uh, since the party were national, also the coalitions should be. It lasted for two elections only, and the politicians didn't accept that, and I think that in a federation, well, sometimes it makes sense to have different coalitions in different states because the political realities in different places, they are, they, they are different also. Uh, and so it lasts only for two elections, uh, and after that, 
well, the interpretation was that, well, parties are national, not necessarily coalitions are national. <laughs> it's a different way. I would say that it's a, a side effect. No, may, may, maybe adding one um, more comment is uh, also this, the way how this political part works in Brazil is, uh, I would say it's the side effect of a symmetric federation. There is also one rule for everything. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, to uh, yeah, give a very, very brief answer on that uh, for the German case, um, I think, Rupert, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, we can't think about all this, probably also intergovernmental relations. They are also heavily influenced in Germany by partisanship because normally um, all the ministers in the Bundesrat, they meet before um, sessions according to their partisanship. So the Greens meet together, then the left meet together, the Social Democrats meet together, and so on and so on. Afterwards, they meet with the more leftist bloc and then with the more rightist. So there's a lot of coordination rounds which are, which exactly, to, to find at some point a compromise. Um, and this is, this is something I, I, I must stress for the German case is that we have the very many, many avenues for parties to capture the whole system, to block everything, to um, enforce gridlock, but they don't do it so far. This is why the German system is still working, because we have a vertically integrated party system, which basically means that we also have the same parties, relevant parties, I would say, which are at all levels, including the European level, for us also very important, um, and down to the municipality level. So basically it's all the same parties. There are a few exceptions to this, but not um, from the big parties, let's say. And the leaders of the lender, they are usually also part of the national leadership of the party. So for example, our chancellor, he used to be the mayor of Hamburg. So he started his career in the land. We, this is normally where your career starts as a German politician. So parties already balance a lot of tensions, federal tensions, they already balance this within the party. Mm -hmm. So for example, the Christian Democrats now, their leader is heavily criticized these days, but from their, his own party colleagues from the lender. So we already have this kind of, kind of balancing. And this is one particular um, thing about the German party system. And the other one is what I mentioned is that they acknowledge the rules of, federal, of the federal game, let's say. They, 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 um, they uphold the rules, they uphold the norms, they, they want to compromise. We have this compromise culture. Germans are very reluctant on, on, on competition and, and arguments and we don't like that so much so we rather like to have find compromises and to be a very objective in a way uh, i mean of course we have also party competition but we still at this federal uh, in this federal system we still try and the the german party still try to uphold these rules and norms they all also did that during the covid pandemic where you had the conference of the premiers uh, what Johanna was mentioning and Yvonne was mentioning, and there you had um, heads of the lender from the left party to the Christian Social Union of Bavaria coming together, finding compromises. And at least, I mean, we still, I mean, this lasts for today. I mean, maybe one year we see the YouTube video and we laugh at my uh, talk because uh, this obviously is, uh, is also subject to change. And also we have this competitor the alternative for Germany, which um, yeah will will maybe change some of the game, but for now at least I feel confident to say that the federal norms, routines, and and rules are pretty much acknowledged by the actors and also uphold uphold by them. Yeah.
now it's working. Oh, I would say that uh, Rogério and I, we didn't plan any formal statement to finalize this event, so it's very informal uh, conversation, I would say. Uh, first of all, I would like to, to thank to Rogério because we're planning this event in the last few months. We have a lot of work in order to define the agenda, the guests, international and Brazilian colleagues, um, to think about how to connect the different issues in order to establish a common, um, I would say, uh, linkage between the, 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 the teams, uh, to get funds to organize this event. Uh, we're squeezing our uh, short budget, uh, adding my, 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 my support received from FGV uh, research and publications and the fund from Rogério and, he, and his uh, FAPESP research project. So uh, I, I, I don't know about you, Rogério, but I am very happy with the final result of this event because um, I, I would say we had opportunity to to gather is a lot of high qualified expert in the international arena and landscape and also in Brazil and well I do not have much more words because I think we are a little much more tired after two days discussing in this in this room and also because much of them we were um, until last week also participating at IPSA Congress, so you are a little bit tired, I would say. So basically, that's it. Uh, uh, finally, I, I I I I would remind, especially our international and national speakers, that tomorrow we will have one final session. It is a closed session, so in this case, uh, just um, refer to learn how uh, international experiences uh, have been working in order to organize these intergovernmental relations. So basically we have the experience from Mexico, from Germany, also from the United States, uh, maybe uh, from, from Australia, indirectly speaking, because Alan Fiona will travel tomorrow uh, early in the morning. So in this case, Johanna maybe could talk us about Australian experience and also Rupak will talk about Canadian experience and sure the Brazilian officers represented by Andre and Eleni will talk uh, uh, for us how in fact this is the Council of Federation uh, have been thinking in order to implement this uh, federative arena, I would say as short as possible. You know? So basically, uh, that's it. So thank you so much for your participation. Yeah. It's this one. This is a real example of Vito Point. This is a Vito Point. <laughs> <laughs> the microphone is a Vito Point. So thank you so much. That's it. There is no uh, no more words. We are very happy. So Rogério, now the word is yours. Thank you, Eduardo Green, uh, for the whole partnership. I think that the the seminar uh, went beyond my expectations, perhaps of yours. I just have acknowledgments and, and thanks to to uh, mention now. First of all, to Johanna uh, Pity, she is not here, but she she was fundamental to put us together uh, at the beginning. Um, I'd like to to thank the staff, all the support we have these two days. Uh, nothing would be possible without you. I, I, I'm really grateful. Um, and that's it. And we, we are kind of tired. So, uh, you know, um, we, we have just, we have to thank to the, the lecturers, to the speakers. Thank you very much for being uh, this far to uh, talk, talk to us, to exchange ideas with us. And that's it. Thank you very much. Tomorrow morning, uh, our meeting, it will be held on the third floor 
in the in the room aside to our uh, i would say uh, leading uh, the, our the team and the vice team work so pay attention uh, uh, behave rightly <laughs> no I, i'm kidding <laughs> so see you tomorrow nine o'clock okay but uh, in the, before that we will have our, our day in the